don't even know what that is. What's going on here? Something about those old hymns, every one of them just sounds so familiar to my spirit. You know? Mm -hmm. You just know that they played it and they knew what they were doing. Somebody you just got a song and a melody, and you change the melody around and it's still godly. <laughs> and it still bears witness, amen? Mm -hmm. And that's what is so important, is that it bears witness to those that are called out. They're called out by the voice of God. And they know His Spirit. They know His Holy Spirit. And that's a good place for the title of the word tonight. The title of the word is, uh, The heart of the matter is all that matters. And it's the second place in the Holy of Holies thoughts. Which unfortunately, I don't know if I can get a lot of those places of altars and new ideas for that. So we'll wait upon the Holy Spirit right now, because uh, different things going on today is kind of keeping me on lots of different pages, but I don't want to be on lots of different pages right now. It's a good time to be in sorrow and prayer, and I always love to live there, because then I know that the Lord can show up and do what He has to do, and if He doesn't do what He has to do, then my whole day and my whole week is worth, is, is, is considered a cardinal failure. Because I cannot live off of bread alone. Amen? Mm -hmm. I can live off of the words of, the, of life. And he's the only one that gives the words of life. Amen? Mm -hmm. And I'm happy that he's speaking. I'm happy that he's a fire, the consuming fire that still burns. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. We praise you, Lord, in this house today, Heavenly Father. We bow our hearts before the O Lord. Hallelujah. We lift our life up to you, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that you alone are God and there is none other. Praise your name forever. In this little church, Lord God, among people that are consecrated to you, set apart for thy will, Lord. And you speak into the hearts of your people that are not distracted, not too busy to come to the table of God. God Almighty, help those that are distracted and waste time with things that seem right, that are worthless, when there's a table to come to. Deliver them from hearts filled with excuses of flesh and selfishness. O oh Lord, deliver us all from self to the Savior, that we may know Him in spirit and in truth. In a gloriously grounding way, Lord Almighty. Ground us and deepen us in the Spirit of God. Be all oh, powerful in our midst today, Lord God, and bring this wonderful word of life and enriching, strengthening power, living water, words of washing. Hallelujah! Bring a spiritual car wash to our souls tonight, Lord. Entrench us, Lord, in the river of life. Amen, amen, amen. Bless your name forever, Lord God. Glory, glory to the living God, the only God. And there is none like you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah and amen to your wonderful name. And thy wonderful, amazing, awesome Son, Jesus, 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 bless us with the Holy Ghost in this house, and deliver us from every evil thing, drive back the power of the devil, unclean thoughts, and disease, by the power of the blood of Jesus, rebuke the devourer, Lord God Almighty, destroy the work of the enemy, Lord, let it stop here and set the captives free in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Oh, praise the Lord. Where are we in Malachi, huh? Just a couple places to turn tonight, not a lot. 
because the word of God is going to go. You guys ready for the word? Yes. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Scriptural way of offering is a, is a scriptural thing. <laughs> and if you're already filled with worship and you're already low and he's increasing, it's very easy to, to let him go up higher and higher. Because he's always higher. <laughs> it's just a matter of do we see it or not for who he is. Yeah. That's what renewing our mind is all about. Amen. Yeah. So we can remember again every day. We know your mercies are new forever. Those are the words. But when his mercies have reached our heart and our life and gave us that consecrated place away from fear and doubt. <laughs> Hallelujah. And bring us into the most holy place. Amen. That's what it's all about. It's easy to preach. To, it's easy to preach when the music is going. I tell you, that's wonderful. <laughs> it's going to end and my preaching will continue. Don't worry. Don't let it distract you. Don't let anything distract you. Just listen to the word of God. Because he's, he's put all kinds of stuff in me today. In this week. For those that are hungry. Amen. I remember last week we were talking about the profaning of an altar. And, uh, all right, I'll turn it off now. Turn that off. The profaning of the altar was last week one of the many parts. And, uh, I was right about the Ten Commandments in the, uh, tabernacle. It's true. There's actually a couple sets of four pillars. And, uh, it's not a mistake by any means. The, uh, before we go into the holy place, the, the, the pillars are there, and there's a, there's a linen cover over the most holy place, and that is the Ten Commandments representation that we pray through. The priests did do before they went into the most holy place, and there was three more places inside there, and then the fourth in that most holy place was the, was the mercy seat. Hallelujah. The mercy seat is where the Lord Jesus is. It looks like an Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament, but it's the mercy seat with blood and the Savior, Jesus Christ, today. Is this too distracting with the screens on? Is that hard for you guys, or is that okay? It's distracting. Too much? Okay. Let's cut them off. We don't need them. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Whatever it takes to get tuned in, right? But it's true there is many altars in, in the whole process of going in all the way into the Holy of Holies. And there's a lot of people in the body of Christ that have uh, only gone so far. And they've been told that's all you need to go, as if there's no more deeper places to go in the Lord. And I believe that's dead, deadly to the, to the growth of the body of Christ. And it keeps them stuck and stagnant in one place that is is far from the works of the Holy Spirit in a soul's life, in a saint's life that we can get. No, it's not true, so I'm against it. Smith Wigglesworth says, Oh, the glory of God, there's always room to go up. But we don't go up in God unless we come down. Amen? If we don't decrease, then the Lord does not increase. Amen? This is where we can win the victory of God. Eternal victory of God only does come, praise the name of the Lord, when we are willing to come down in the place the Spirit of Almighty God brings us to. It's the only place we'll ever get anything victorious because God did not make us for ourselves. He did give us a will, but He did give us, He made us for His glory. And only those who will grow in this glory, in the will of the Father and the Son and God the Holy Ghost, I tell you, they are the only ones who will understand triumphant, eternal victory in Jesus. They're the only ones who know what it means to go into the past the veil and into that most holy place where the Lord and His blood is truly there to do another work. God is, behold, doing a new thing. In the body of Christ that is not ready for new wine, God says, i got to start all over. Yes, my beginning work was real, but so is the latter. 
and so is the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. And believe, dear children of God, there's never an end. His ways are past finding out. He is an unsearchable God. His treasures are unsearchable. And we'll never find the end of all he has for us. The blood is on the mercy seat. The Lord is there in this most glorious place of self-denial. Every bit of process here is God, your God, I can now measure up. God, your God, again, I can never measure up. Don't let me profane your altars and give you nothing but trash. Jesus did die for the sins of the world, but he did not deliver people from sin of what we've done alone. The Lord died on the cross to deliver you from sin and self. He did not just wash away your sins. He washed away your will to live for the glory of self. And when we come to this version of Christianity today in America, which is so prevalent, God already forgave me. I can do whatever I want. I'm saying you did not hear the truth. And you know not the gospel of Jesus Christ. He made everything for his own self and his own will. He didn't just ask for your trash. He asked for you. And we've been trained in American churches and the global, this global understanding of Christianity. He's taken all my sins away. Now I'm free to do whatever I want. That is a lie. He has died mostly to get the sin out of the way so he can have a holy people unto himself. He died, he sent his son to die on the cross to purchase a people. He doesn't want your sin. He wants you. And any type of gospel that just pays for sin for you to go and live like a bastard child is of Satan. He doesn't want your sin. God hates sin. He abolished sin. He, pet, he paid the penalty for sin to get it out of people so he can win what belongs to him, people that he made. He made you for his glory. God hates sin. He paid the ultimate price to get it out. People want to believe some philosophy of oh, my sins are all forgiven. My dear friend, you don't know God. And if you ever had any type of beginning, I tell you, you're starting to die out big time. Don't listen to those philosophies and traditions of men. Because the Lord does not dwell there. He dwells between the cherubim. And he still speaks there. Shekinah glory comes to the mercy seat to go there when you're willing to go through the true process of self-denial. Don't offer him the blind in Malachi. So as you profane my altar, how did we do that? How did we, how did we, how did we profane your altar? Because you gave me junk. You gave me what you don't even want. You wouldn't even give it to your own leaders. But you give it to God as if he doesn't notice. It would be one thing if we had done this to the Lord, giving him all kinds of trash, assuming he wants it in our ignorance, but the people knew it. They knew better. A lot of the mistakes that happened in the, in the Word of God throughout the whole history of the old and the new was mistakes that they knew. Makes it that much more dangerous. You need to understand this one scripture here. I'm, you don't have to turn to it. I'll just read it to you. It's only one verse. In 1 Corinthians 14, 23, talking about tongues again, it says, If therefore the whole church be come together in one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned, or unbelievers, Will they not say that ye are mad? It's like, what in the world does that have to do with anything? anything? <laughs> a lot. A lot. This is the only place he says don't get carried away with tongues. And it's for the unlearned 
an unbeliever. It didn't say anything about the believer. It said, for the sake of the unbeliever and the unlearned, those people who don't know what that really means. The only scripture I can find where it would try to hinder the spiritual gift of tongues is this one right here. And it doesn't say it's, it's to hold it back for the believer's sake. It was to hold it back, careful how it goes on among those who don't understand. That should be obvious. When someone new comes into the group, I don't keep on doing what I'm doing. It changes the environment. I have to fit the moment. The Lord makes it very obvious. And those that know the Holy Spirit, they understand the heart of the matter. And as different faces show up, different issues show up. And those become the most prominent thing that the Lord would like to deal with. And if we kept on going like business as usual, we would be letter people. We would be swallowing camels. We would be straining gnats and trying to force something that is not necessary. Whatever the most needed thing at the moment is, is the biggest focus of the, of the now. The body of Christ lives in triumph. They live in the now. They have goals of living for God in the future, but they're listening to Him now. Amen? Not everything needs an interpretation. If someone was to stub their toe and they started making all kinds of funny noises, you wouldn't ask them what did they mean by that. It would be very, very obvious that they were in pain. Priest Eli saw somebody praying and making no noise while praying, and he thought she was drunk. He didn't understand what she was doing didn't matter. She was praying. <laughs> you can't always hear someone when they're praying, and it doesn't matter. The fact that they're seeking God in an honest heart, the Holy Spirit makes it evident that this is in union. Not everything needs an explanation. This is the only text where it says the unknown shouldn't be revealed to the unlearned. The Holy Spirit makes it very clear what the now need is. The body of Christ walks by the Spirit. They obey the commands of God, but by the Spirit, the heart of the matter is all that matters. For a living church with a pulse that walks by the living presence of God. When the living water truly flows, we don't sit there and point at letters as if every letter is the now. The letters is something we study to learn the words of God and how did he conduct himself with these people? How did he conduct himself with these people? And bless the Lord, O oh my soul, how is he going to conduct himself with us people today? Eliminating God's word? Never. Every last letter on this book means something today. And a lot of people don't know what that means, and I'm one of them. We get hung up on letters. We start to become brothers and sisters who choke on camels and strain at gnats. And become a very letter person. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The life of the Spirit is the now true word of the Lord, okay? More places as we go through the, the, the altar stages. In other places where we're leaving comfortable places, it's another situation of leaving the Father's house. We talked about last week. I'm going to add to it. I'm going to go through it for the next few weeks and just continue to add to all these different places so we can learn more about what it means to go through there and have more, uh, more ex examples and such of what we can learn about what the brazen altar really means about Calvary. There's a lot of things, there's a lot of layers to the brazen altar that I haven't touched yet that I have to get clear before I can start to release them prophetically. But here's one of them. The Father's house is immobile and it has, an, it has a sense of I cannot go any further unless I'm willing to depart from here. When, when Abraham left his father's house, when Abraham left his own situation, he had to leave into the unknown. He walked by faith at the word of God, at the word of the Lord. If he was to read the Torah and then try to find a verse for that, he would have been off. But he walked by faith. Faith cometh by hearing. And he heard from God. And God told him to leave. And he did. And when we leave certain areas, when you go to a new area, a new opportunity, things are different now. Not everything is in the same place that you're used to. There's a different comfort. There's a comfort about the Father's house. 
And so it takes a lot of faith, a lot of takeoff power to go into the unknown. I remember that little story that was so cool about that. It was baby lion that was found by a farmer, and he brought him to his home, and he was a sheep herder. And the little lion was, a, was friends with all the baby sheep, and he kept on growing up, and they were used to him, and he made noises like the sheep because he was just acting like his own surrounding. And in Africa, they were over by the water. All the sheep would go to drink in the water, and everything was fine because they were used to this lion. But whenever they saw a different lion, they would be scared, and they'd all run and start bad and bad, run back to shelter where they were safe. Mm -hmm. But one time when they all went down to the water, this lion, lamb, looks into the water and sees his own reflection. And he started to run like he, like he did every other time. And he looked around at all his friends and they weren't running and they couldn't figure out why they didn't run. Why didn't you see the monster? He was there. I saw him. And then it dawned on him, that was me. And then he goes and sees these other lions across the river, and they're staring at him in a big old pack, and he wasn't scared anymore. And he looks at them and says, I can either stay here where I'm comfortable and I'm used to. I'm immobile over here, but I can walk into the unknown, into my true destiny. I can walk over here with sheep, or I can walk where I belong. And I believe that we're supposed to do that over and over again. As the Spirit leads, as the Spirit leads, he was, he's, if He invites us to go into the unknown and say, I know you're comfortable there, but I got so much more if you would trust me out here. I want to do something so powerful in your life. Behold, I do do a new thing. Going through these altars as a place of renewing this thing. They didn't just go through there one time. They met the holies of holies more. And as they did, they had to pick up and move. They had the timing of the Holy Spirit. They, fell, they followed God. Hallelujah. He communicated right there in that glory between the cherubim. And he told his people exactly what they needed to know. Amen. He's still talking today. This king is still there between those cherubim. There's blood there for forgiveness, and there's a king with a voice. He's the great shepherd, and his sheep know that voice. Praise God. Another one is like a rocket, when they're taking like a NASA rocket and they're trying to blow this thing off the, off the earth and into orbit, the beginning stages, most of the power is here in the beginning. 90% of all the power it needs to get all the way out there is right at the beginning. Takeoff is very difficult. It's like waking up in the morning. You're so heavy. You're so tired. Your mind is so not new. You don't want to pray. All you can think about is, I want more sleep. I want this. It's very hard. The takeoff part is the very, very toughest part. But after that, it starts to get easier, and you start to go, oh, Lord, I can see you working here. Oh, man. And then you let part of it off, and it floats into space, into the unknown. It doesn't matter anymore. It's already served its purpose. Some of the places that you go are only steps. You know, you're not meant to camp there all the time. He says, I want to put new wine in these, in these wineskins. Hallelujah. Well, new wine in wineskins. He's like, I want to do a new thing, but you're still acting old. You're too stuck. You're too rigid. You think this is how it's going to be every time. But don't we realize everything that happened in the Word of God happened new. He knocked their socks off and blew their hair back every time. And during all the mighty revivals in the history of the world, they all happened in a different way. He had a different goal in every revival. Everything was different. It didn't take the same amount of prayer beforehand. The actions of the thing, all the chaos that it caused, all the problems that it caused, they were all different, but they were all God. And it's like they could never just enjoy what was happening right then. It was always the persecuting. Hey, this isn't how God did it last time. He says, don't worry. Behold, I do a new thing. There is a time for a new thing. Not to get into the weird stuff, which I'm very clear about. And I draw the line with a very heavy hammer about going into these new things. But God has a new thing. I want to pour new wine, but you've got to become new too. You've got to become pliable again like you used to when you were young. I've been in this house for five years. Every time I get a new roommate, my rules get strict, more strict. More and more strict. I'm getting more and more rigid. This is how I do it in my house. But if I were to change locations, they would all start all over again. I can't act like I did now. I have to become pliable or I'm going to be a big mess. People who get really stuck in their way, there are constant friction everywhere they go. No, no unity, no flow. Always hammering against the always hammering against what's going on. 
No childlike life, no childlike newness, no nothing new. God wants to do new, but we're not letting him because we're not new. A lot of these places of, of self-denial at these altars and letting the blood cleanse us is to cleanse us from what we've become. He says, you've been here so long that you have forgotten how to listen for anew. And it's going to take a lot for this mighty takeoff to the next stage. It's going to be radical. And the Lord says, I'll be there. You know I'll be there. And you're going to love it. I'm going to knock your socks off and do something totally different that you've never expected. I won't move the same way. Yes, that was me. But i got a whole other thing I want to do over here. Amen. Matthew 23, 24, you blind guys that strain it in that and swallow a camel. They are so stuck in their ways. They have all these different things in their head, all these letters in their head. They know what they, they know what the Bible says, but they forgot that the Bible is trying to teach you something about childlike faith. To listen to your Lord. Trust in the Lord. He's not dead, he's alive. Yes, he has a word, but he's still alive. And this same Lord is still trying to speak to his people, and he does. And they listen, and they move. Yeah, they get struggled sometimes. Yeah, they get um, nervous sometimes. Yeah, they even make mistakes sometimes. But God truly wants to do something vitally new. And I believe that cost for the new thing is it's going to be just as, what, 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 what? Just as, like, wonder as the first time. I didn't know. Every time God did something very mighty in my life, and yes, he's done lots of mighty things in my life, I've had many overwhelming presence of God in my life that I just can't even, I, I think about them all the time because it encourages me today. Lord, I know you're going to do something new again. From this glory that you've done to another glory that's coming in my future. I can't wait. Trust me, I'm all ears. My spiritual ears are waiting. <laughs> Amen? I want it. He wants to give it to us more than we want it. Bless the Lord. We leave the Father's house from something immobile to something mobile. We leave the comforts and the, and the familiarity of our Father's house. We're ready to change our ways. The rocket takes off, leaves the ground, and it goes further. The lion leaves what is familiar to him to go into the unknown, going forward into the unknown. There was a test they used to do with fleas. They would stick fleas in a jar, and they could jump out of the jar with, with no, without even thinking. Just fly right on out. But after a while, they put this lid on there. So all that same amount of fleas, they jump up and they bounce off the ceiling. Mm -hmm. Just up and bumping the top over and over and over again. And after a while, you take that lid right off, and that one of them fleas will jump out because they've been conditioned to think they can't go further. Mm -hmm. And I say that is an awesome description of the body of Christ, to tell them there's no more room to go. This is it. I'm telling you, that's not true. That is so not true. Those priests did not go into the Holy of Holies just once. They went there over and over and over. I tell you, if we walk in that, we're walking by a level of faith that's going to put your feet on water and walk like Peter. And bless the Lord, oh my soul, if we can walk there and not look at the waves and continue to look at the Holy of Holies, to look at that king who's on the mercy seat. Amen? Hallelujah. That's what I want to live at. God forgave us from sin in order to go forward and to become his. He's purchased, purchased a people. He purchased our sin to throw it away and purchased us so we could be pure for him. Holy and acceptable for the Lord. Amen. There's a lot of things that we're going to learn from the word of God. There's many different, there's many different topics in the Bible, hundreds of them. And they all begin in the book of Genesis. Every, every puzzle that needs to be put together begins in the book of Genesis as if there's only maybe even one or two different pieces to the puzzle in there. And those understandings of God, those theologies or those ways we understand this is something true. It begins there and pieces become further and further, more advanced pieces, and each puzzle gets finished by the whole book. So people who say, I've read this and this, you might have, you might have learned some things. You might have learned some, some things from the Lord, but truly, God's book is, is a complete book. And I believe that when we start to see the wholeness of this thing, we'll start to understand what God has been trying to say versus what we've been taught all of our lives. If we've been taught by people who have not been through that veil, do you not think that we'll become a little flea and never even imagine we can go past that level? We can go way past that level. All things are possible to them that believe. Amen? <laughs> I want to fly out of that thing and live in the fly. I say, what's next, Lord? Let's go all the way in there. Can I die further? Can I come down lower that you can increase even further? Lord, you can manifest your power in my life all you want to, and I don't care the cost. 
Our prayer must be all at all costs. You show me, Holy Spirit, what the Lord has for my life. I want to walk in power. I want to walk in a way that would declare the glory of God. The people will know I've been past that veil. I've heard a lot of people talk about that thing, but I haven't heard, I have not in years seen any significant changes in their lives. And in those significant changes in our lives, you know what's going to happen? A lot of really hardships because there's, there's the price to be paid in these places is extreme. And the Lord trying to deal with us and our selfish nature is, is radical and it hurts a lot. And so I thank God for the saints of God that want to continue on and go through the suffering. He leads us through the woe. It's going to be painful. But I tell you, at the end of that thing, you're going to see another place of the king on that mercy seat again. More blood to deal with deeper sins. Places that we didn't even know. God had to miraculously reveal them to us for us to have any clue of what to repent from. The Bible says you can't even say Jesus is Lord, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything about salvation is the power of God revealed in people's lives. The heart of the matter is all that matters still. Everything the Lord ever wants to do, whatever he meant in every text that he's ever, that's ever been laid down in this word, just, just what he meant in there should be so obvious if we have childlike faith. In the same way, like Kent Hovind says, they've got you right from the beginning because they've got you set in the wrong channel already by this by every book you open up in the, in, the, in, the, in the school. Six billion years ago, as if that's how long things have been going on. And so all your belief is going to come from six billion years ago. A big bang happened. Some big old thing happened. And all these things started to grow. And you already dismissed the fact that there's God. You think everything is just from many, many years ago and we're all just animals. And you're all, you have all your philosophy built on the wrong channel just from the get-go. And I'm telling you, it is no different in the body of Christ when they say, Hey, it's all forgiven. You're free. All you have to do is believe. That's just that's all it says. Anybody, I've heard guys sitting there telling you, The Bible doesn't say you have to repent from sin. I'm like, are you kidding me? From the top to bottom, God says, I hate sin. And he shows you what he thinks about sin. Nobody in this world has been through that veil who talks like that. They've got you on the wrong channel all the way from the get-go. They did that to me when I was young. And I tell you, it was, a, it was an incredible war in my life. And I never got to hear from God. Hey, you're saved. You already believe. And you can never lose your salvation. Good. What do I, so I can do whatever I want and everything's fine. But you tell them the truth about what the text actually says. And you'll see that there's many, many warnings. Warning after warning. Don't, don't get caught up with this thing over here. It's going to drown your spirit. This is evidence that your faith is turning into something that it shouldn't. Turning your faith into a, from a person that used to adore God and listen to God and pay a new price for him to do a new thing into someone who becomes the authority of all kinds of letters that don't get anything done at all for his kingdom. One of the things of self that needs to come down is religious self. It doesn't matter. Sensual self is bad enough, but it's still self. And people like to hide behind one of the worst fig garments that they've ever tried to cover themselves up with, and that's religious pride. And Timothy, or Colossians, excuse me, Colossians talks about it being... Oh, yeah, it has, a, it has a certain show of true religion, but it isn't God. It's not God worship. It's called will worship. You worship your own will to do what you think looks religiously right according to your own fleshly disobedient text view. And that becomes very popular on the web. I thank God that there are real preachers out there that are noticed by thousands. But it's pretty normal by now, I see. It's those people that let people be themselves to do whatever they want to and not bring a strong, urgent, clear warning constantly. Peter said we're supposed to be in, Peter, in, in, in fear constantly. Stay in constant fear so you stay sober. Why would he, stay, why would he tell us to stay sober if there, wasn't a, if, if there wasn't a lion out there, a Satan trying to devour us. True Christian faith requires sobriety. 
it requires hiding away with the Lord on a very normal basis. To always not forsake the gathering of the saints. Your faith should need it. A true saint would say, this is my life here. My soul is at stake here. I hear people get careless about things. I said, I'll, I'll dump all kinds of mercy on you, dear friend, when you mess up. But I need to know your attitude towards what happened. I got a notice from a person that, one of the, one of the people that watch here what we're doing, what the Lord is doing in here, and let me know that they didn't do so hot. And they were afraid to let me know. And it was very easy, because of what I, the humility that I saw, to bury them with, with gentleness. I'm not going to take you to the beating town. I'm going to take you to mercy town. Depending on your attitude toward the mistakes, depends on what's going to happen out of my own mouth. I'll either take you to warn you and, and, and bring you a strong rebuke, or I'll take you to Mercy Town and Gentle Town to let you know I hear you. It can happen to anybody. Making bad mistakes can happen to anybody. I was so blessed to get on Sermon Index and I saw people talking about um, this gentleman called Robert Slearden, and I'm not making fun of him. I'm doing exactly what he's doing. He said these are the mistakes people have made, and it just so happens that he, bless his heart, made a mistake as well. And I'm not coming against him. And someone was very merciful and godly to say that could happen to anybody you should be praying for him saying thank god that he's that something has happened that things are in the light by now so he has a chance to get things right in real you don't want that boy dying when he's when he's not playing straight that's the mercy of god to put things into light amen and if anybody in here gets off track anybody watching on youtube gets off track Bless the Lord of my soul if it all comes to the light so it can be dealt with before you see the one who will deal with everything at his throne. And Poonin says anything that's not dealt with on this life will be dealt with at the throne. It's true. Amen. It will be. I was blessed to watch uh, someone that I don't always totally agree with um, doing some extremely great work in the streets. He was dealing with Christians and all kinds of different people with all kinds of different views in the streets and interviewing them and confronting them about what they're doing with their life. And a lot of them was believers and they were confessing that, yeah, I, I watch this kind of junk, yeah, and on and on and on. He says, what's the difference between that and, and being a peeping Tom? He says, maybe those people on the movies, maybe they knew they were being filmed and they knew they were going to be in front of a giant screen. But to you, it should be the same. To see people behind closed doors doing what they should not be doing in front of a camera, to you it's the same as peeking in the window. It might not be the same on their end because they know that people are looking. But to you, it's the same. To you, it's no different than like Jesus saying, well, if you commit the adultery or you just look with lust in your heart, it's the same. And he says, do you see what I'm saying? And some other lady, oh, if, if there is a God, I don't believe that he would ever throw anybody into hell. And, and so he's like, you think Hitler's got to have a nice mansion in heaven? No, he's going to be in hell for sure. So you made a judgment. Do you understand how God makes a judgment about all sin? It's really amazing how you can just flip-flop everything. We walk in our own way long enough, my, my goodness, dear hearts. You have no idea what our wicked minds will come up with to eliminate responsibility. So I tell you, the more the Lord will grow you up, the more opportunities you ever get, the more spiritual growth that you do get, more responsibility. You can always tell when people don't have responsibility about the things that come out of their mouth. Their hearts are ex ex revealed and exposed through their mouth, their careless mouth. I'm like, if you had responsibility in your life and you actually grew up, you would not be talking like a child who's been spoon-fed all of his life. You talk like a man who understands reality. 
Yes, there's a time to preach. Yes, there's a time to witness. Yes, there's a time to pray. Yes, there's a time to be in the Word of God. But there's a time to dance, a time to laugh, a time to cry, a time to get up, a time to go down, a time for war, a time to kill, a time to everything. There's a time for everything. But it's not always time to do just one thing. A man would know that. People who grow, they understand more responsibility. They know how to handle all kinds of different situations. I was talking to a really powerful professional, someone who's way up in the business world, and the way he communicated to me inspired me. I said, that's a man who's got a lot of responsibility, and he can't afford things to go wrong. So he's very, very careful about the way he communicates. I said, that's awesome. I can learn from that. Whether he's serving God or he's not serving God, it's irrelevant. I saw something that I could use in my own little bank here, and it added to my own arsenal. And say, I want to be even more careful how I communicate to others. People, I think, oh, who cares about them? I'll just be careless with that guy because he's not going to matter anyway. He'll never come to my church. He'll never come to God. He'll never tell anybody what I said. No, everybody matters. Because our own life matters before God. Our reputation on earth matters. And our re reputation gets shattered then God cannot use us anymore as much as he could. We're less effective because people are going to, oh, no, I know that guy. He talks very carelessly. People who have a responsibility, they know that all the little things matter. They know how to handle all kinds of little things. So praise the Lord if he'll grow us up even further. Give us more authority, more anointing, deeper understanding, and then we'll understand the deeper responsibility so we don't fail him at a higher level. The bigger we go, the harder we can fall. Bless the Lord if He can raise up somebody that will not fall, because they'll always stay on rock. I had to bring some very incredible thoughts this week because of what I read in Timothy about people turning from a minister of God into a minister of Satan, starting on the right track and turning into something very dangerous. And I brought that warning up a couple times this week. It just so happened that verse was fresh on my mind, and I'm saying, hey, if you judge yourself, you're not going to be judged. If you will humble yourself, you won't be humbled. But if you will be careless, you might turn into something you don't want to turn into. A person with all kinds of excuses, but yet they don't stop talking about God. They talk about God in the wrong spirit. That's very dangerous. It causes a lot of confusion while you're trying to choke on a camel and preach the word of God. You know how sometimes when you go and sneeze or you're coughing, your ears shut off, you can't hear? Like, it's like you, like you go like that, and it's like somehow it connects to your ears, and that your ears can't, they're deaf for just a second. It's almost like that's happening. When someone's choking on the camel or they're straining in that, they're in a place where they can't even hear anymore. It's very scary. Things that are very clear and very obvious are no longer audible for certain people because of their legalistic ways. Their leaven kind of ways. It's a leaven of legalism. Letter addiction. But no heart of the matter that's so evident to anybody in the room. The Holy Spirit moves. You don't need to know what they're crying about. You don't need to know what they're howling about. I was looking up the word howling in the Bible. It's in there a few times. It's always talking about a people who has busted the law of God and they're inside the punishment and they're howling in agony. Oh, ah. I'm like, can I get an interpretation of that, please? Babies go, da, da, da. they don't know what they're saying. But you can tell what they're saying. You can tell whether they're happy with mama or they're mad at mama. You don't need an interpretation. There's something that's so far more real. They said that, that communication verb is, is less verbal than anything. Body language, the countenance of your face, the way you act, the way you handle yourself. It's very, very clear what people are trying to communicate. Communication of the reality of the heart of the matter is so much more about the Holy Spirit than just words. People get so focused on words. It's no different than people getting started off on the wrong foot. The Word of God is there to help you understand how to walk in the Spirit. The Word of God is here to teach you how to go to the Holy of Holies. Yourself. Not just to memorize Scripture and stay a dead man. Just like the person who's got their mind and, oh, there's no God. We, we were made six billion years ago. You're off from the beginning, man. Your whole foundation needs to be destroyed and start all over. Deny that self that believes that. Wicked philosophy. And anybody out there who just wants to make it all about letters, you're no better. In fact, you're even worse. Because you say there is a God. 
And they don't even believe in God. Both of you are not portraying God, but you're saying God, and it's even more confusing. It's worse. Letter addicts are worse than atheists because it's confusing. This is clear. Legalism is confusing. And it's not of the Lord. The Lord is so clear. People try to say, but this is of the Lord. I'm like, that's not clear. The Lord makes things abundantly clear to me. Whenever he's speaking to me, I know exactly what he means. Sometimes I don't want to know. Most of the time I don't want to know. I'm like, God, I already have enough truth I can't handle. Please work with me here. Help me get through these things. Help me to be not fearful of the unknown. Let me walk in this new place, Lord. You want to bring the newness of life. I want to walk in it, Lord, but I'm a little scared. Would you please just grease the wheels and get me through this thing? Let me see your son again on that mercy seat and wash me clean of things I didn't even want to know about. Idols I didn't want to know about, but they're real. I keep on seeing places in my heart, maybe, for people of the body of Christ. Maybe they're seeing places in their heart where they're offering the blind to God, offering stuff that he doesn't even want. Stuff that we don't even want. We're offering him our worst, and he wants our best. The Father did not send his worst. He sent his best, his own way. One and only begotten Son. That's what it's all about, our best. Those who truly give the best, I believe that they're going to go through the veil. Those who will be honest at every stage will be the ones who go through the veil and receive the heart of the matter, what God really does have to say. More so than putting scriptures together that might find some interesting things. But will it look like an altar? Will it look like the table of showbread? Will it look like the seven candlesticks? Will it look like the incense? Will it look like the power of God through that veil? Will Christ ever be revealed or not? That's the question. Letters are great, but if you use them wrong, they're the most dangerous thing ever. Why? Because the power of the Word of God is unbelievable. It can be used for the glory of God, and it can be used for the glory of self, which is the spirit of Antichrist and rebellion and witchcraft. So yes, the Bible can be used for witchcraft's sake if it's used by someone who will not go through the, through, through the veil themselves. Like, but the book says, but the book says, but the book says. I'm like, yeah, it says a lot of things. It says that you'll know his voice. Tell me when he's talked to you. How has he revealed truth to your heart? Your heart, I believe that he hasn't done it. That's why we're not in union here. Yes, the book is true, but look at under, under a broken childlike heart to know that you can do nothing of any eternal, eternal glory. The only way I can ever stay strong year after year and grow even is to come to God saying, I can do nothing in my flesh at all. Just today's prayer of, oh my God, I didn't spend enough time with you. I didn't spend enough time preparing this word. But if you would breathe on it, Lord, we'll feel your presence and we'll know what you're all about. We'll know what the heart of the matter is for us now. And it's not the same message for anybody watching this. It's different for everybody because everybody is different. God has a different thing to deal with for us to come down lower and Christ to be more exalted in our lives. Spiritual reality is everything. It only comes when we come down. Letters are good. They're used for the glory of Christ, not the glory of turning our shoulders away from the Lord, which is so mo which is so what happened through a lot of what happened in, in the Word of God. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and pray. And I, uh, I'll do a, some Q&A in just a little bit, some discussion time, but I really, I feel like this is such a serious word, so I kind of like that feeling of when, when we just kind of get, you know, really broken before the Lord, really bent over before the Lord in our hearts. To be in agony of this thing, you know. People are kneeling before the Lord. I don't have to know what they're saying. You don't have to put a mic by someone whispering their prayers. I don't care what they're saying. I just know that they're, I know the heart of the matter, and that is everything. The heart of the matter is is all that matters. Heavenly Father, the heart of the matter is all that matters, Lord. And you always get to the heart of the matter, Lord, that actually brings newness. More than all these opinions of people that get nothing done, Lord God. And I so can't feel your presence when I listen to them talk. I so can't hear a testimony that declares the glory of God. I can't see humility, Lord. I see religious self there, Lord God. And in, their, and in your presence, it would be destroyed. It would be rejected, Lord God, because it's bad. Like the blind sacrifices that is profanity, Lord God, to your altar. 
and how dare flesh try to glory in your presence, Lord God. You reject it, and there's some coming to false religion that has a form, Lord God. It has a look of it, but it's worshiping of will and not worshiping of you. And you're alive, God, to those that care about your will. And you are real to those that fear your name, that hate sin, not because they don't want to look bad, but because they don't want to grieve your Holy Spirit and disrupt their only life source, the living water that you do bring. I see people rejecting things, Lord God, but I don't see us coming to the same conclusions. God Almighty, bring sorrow to the hearts of people that will come low and stop being so happy with where we're at, Lord God, and to stop fearing the unknown, to stop fearing coming unrigid and becoming pliable before your Holy Spirit. Trying to teach old dogs new tricks, Lord God, is a miracle. It's hard enough to teach new young pups. But after we've got so settled in our ways, we think we know everything, Lord God. We don't know anything unless you're moving now. You're a God of now. You're a God of glory. You're a God of power. You're a God of mercy. You're a God of today. You're a God of forever. You was and is and is to come. God. And we seek a kingdom that is not made by hands. But it's a builder and maker is God. Hallelujah, Lord. Until thy kingdom come and thy will be done, all we are is succumbing to letters and religious self. So may we just knock it off and get over ourselves and remember that we can do nothing of any eternal glory. It is only by your spirit, Lord. Force us there, Lord, if, if need be, to get us there at all costs, that we may know your glory, no matter how low we might have to go, no matter how, how confusing it might look, Lord. May we hang on to truth in the midst of this, this incredible war, knowing that this is the true price for the true anointing, that the true path is filled with suffering. May we enter it and, and be glad in it with whips across our back and rejoice that we were worthy to be, that, to be persecuted for your name. Praise God, if it's done in the Spirit, Lord. Let thy son get honor in this house. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen. Amen? Amen. I went downtown yesterday to do uh, the weekly street evangelism. I'm behind a little bit in my time out there. And uh, there was so much chaos going down there because there's this huge um, kind of a rally thing that they're doing, like the Occupy Portland thing, like they did several years ago. Well, they're doing another one now called Free Free Palestine because of all this rhetoric and all this junk going on, this war that's never that's been going on for hundreds of years. Anybody who has any type of revelation of what's going on, they should know this has been going on for hundreds of years. And I went down there and I'm like, Lord, where do I do? I like to put my giant banner up and just stand there and let everybody see it. Uh, there's people going by all the time getting some kind of a reminder. But it's like, no, you're going to go right, right in the middle of the whole thing. Hundreds of people all over the corners downtown, and I and you don't bring your church banner. Bring the Word of God banner, some signs. I'm more comfortable with giant, but he, the Holy Spirit made it plain. Text Kathy, I'm like, help! <laughs> What's going on? This is weird. Too much stuff going on down here. It doesn't feel like my normal thing. I had to kind of adjust. I'm like, I can't sure what to adjust. She says, you'll know how to do it. And I'm like, you're right. I know what to do. I just don't want to. I don't like carrying the little signs. I like the big ones. But I carried down those things, and I was just perfectly at rest. Nobody messed with me at all. They have all this stuff about Palestine, Palestine. I mean, 90% of them are Muslims with all kinds of head things, guys and girls shouting with megaphones and doing this stuff against Israel. And people thought I was pro-Israel. I'm like, I'm not pro-anything. I'm pro-Jesus. I don't even know what's going on. I, don't, I mean, they said, stop the, help, stop the killing, stop the hate. And I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, stop the killing, stop the hate. And I wanted to start saying free Palestine from sin. Free Palestine from their idolatry. 
Free Palestine from false religion. You might get free, but that's the same as people of God getting free from Rome. Oh, set us free. You came here to set us free from Rome. I'm setting you free from yourselves. It's yourself that's going to set you in the pit of hell forever. I'm looking at the big picture, says the Lord, and these people were not. I wasn't mad at them. They're just trying to be nice. They're just doing this mercenary acts, humanitarian runs. But guess what? It's all over the place. It's not just in Portland. It's everywhere, and they're saying the same stinking thing. Just like Occupy Portland was going on. Same stinking thing all over the world. You trying to tell me that was people setting that up? No. Wicked people, wicked powers set that thing up. And all these little sheep just going along with the flow. They don't know what's going on. Some guy was trying to have a nice conversation with me, and he's, I'm a Catholic, but I'm part of all religions, and blah, blah, blah. Trying to have a peaceful conversation, and I just kind of just like, says, you are going to find it right here on my sign. That's what Jesus said. What do you say? They don't, they don't hear. They can't hear. It's like, I thank God for people who can even kind of hear. Because when you get around people who are just absolutely out to lunch, you're like, God Almighty, you're going to have to pull down fire from heaven to wake these people up. They are so blind. I'm like, my dear friend, God's, God is holy. If you're going to answer to that God, so am I. I tremble at that thought every day. These people are set up with this stuff trying to save Palestine. I know, saving temporarily is wonderful. People dying, children dying, that's terrible. It's horrible what's going on. But it's been going on forever. You know, they're just trying to take their, they're just trying to take their spot in Gaza back because you stole it from them. You don't steal something from somebody, they're not going to come after you, you know? It's ridiculous. Every single time anybody's ever tried to mess with Israel, disaster has come yeah. to America. Yeah. I'm not talking about just a few times, like in Jack Chick's got a great chick track called uh, Somebody, um, was it called Somebody Angry? Yeah. And ever, it's like about eight of them, eight scenarios in there where we give God, uh, um, America and Israel, give up a little bit of Israel's land, for peace, because Palestine was trying to take it. God, no, God says, don't you dare touch my people. You bless my people, I'll bless you. You curse them, I'll kill you. Yeah. He destroys those who do not do right before his people, Israel. That'll always be there. He didn't yeah. divorce them. Yeah. Amen. How come Obama is still alive? <laughs> um, he, because, he, because the scripture must be fulfilled. The false prophet and Antichrist is going to go get cast into the lake of fire. But you get what I'm saying? Yeah. This thing has happened so many times. Everybody who tried to mess with Israel, they got busted big time. Big time. Hurricane Katrina, all those things that had happened, happened like a day after Land for Peace. So don't get mad at Israel for trying to take back what belongs to them. And uh, I remember you had some things that you were learning from it too. I don't know how significant all that stuff really is. Remember you were talking about the bombs or whatever getting just, just knocked out of the way from the wind or something like that? Yeah. It was like Israel was being protected. Right. Remember how the book of Revelation said that God's going to protect them from those that attack from the north? Russia. Russia, exactly. Yeah. But not what was happening there. It's still cool, but it isn't exactly the scripture being fulfilled. You get what I'm saying? Because there was mm -hmm. Palestine attacking them with rockets. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So rockets are coming after Israel. And you say it's like God is making them go off course so they won't hurt them. Can you tell us a little more about that iron dome? Have you ever heard oh. of that before? Yeah, Go ahead and say it nice and clear. The iron dome is, um, I don't know exactly what it is, but when I looked at it, it was on the ground, and they had like, at first when I saw them, they looked like boxes, like they almost looked like wooden pallets, but then they said close up, and they have uh, some kind of um, electrical stuff on the bottom. And what's happening is that they set these things up, and every time rockets or missiles or whatever they call them are going over to hit um, Israel, they, um, these things, um, they kind of like meet them in the air, it meets it in the air or something and it makes them, it. yeah, it makes it just go away or like, <laughs> yeah, or go off course or, or whatever, I don't know what it does, but it's like, because of that iron dome that they have, it's like they're sheltered and it's like 90% of the rockets that have been, um, meant to hit Israel has has not happened. Yeah. That's so, wonderful. Yeah. I know so, something. <laughs> so in the article that I had read where somebody had said um, Palestine has some people that are like in the on their side, Hamas leaders and stuff, somebody had said something to the effect that 
um, we're trying to hit them, but every it's like God is like moving their <laughs> moving the rockets. Their God is moving their rockets from hit to you know to hit them, and then somebody else had said, well, Amen for God giving somebody the intelligence to create the Iron Dome as well, because that has been a huge protector over them. Mm. That's great. Okay. And it's interesting because if you watch some of those like end time movies, like um, Left Behind, whether you agree with it or not, it, it's showing things that's scriptural where like attacks would come and it would bounce off as if there was an invisible shield there. Yeah. yeah. Almost, who knew? Almost like Star Wars. Remember Reagan? He wanted to put his huge shield over the United States and it never went through because he couldn't get enough support for that. Mm. And it was called Star Wars. And it's, that's what he called it. Weird. And, yeah, and, Never heard of that. and uh, he just really wanted to do it, but he just didn't get enough um, people to, to be behind him about it. Yeah. I guess it cost too much money or something. And, yeah. Yeah. You know. yeah. Yeah. What it was was a satellite, and when the when when the radar uh, notices a, a missile coming at it, it would shoot something at it, make it explode out in space. That's what that it was. was. What it was. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure what exactly, but uh, yeah, something like it's something like <coughs> the Swiss Iron Dome is something to the same effect. Similar. And I actually saw the um, the guy that created it. You know, they had a little video on him, and he said that he went to Israel because uh, there had been so much killing that the Palestinians were doing to them that he wanted to do something about it and had this idea and went to them and they turned him down and then some of them were like, well, let's, you know, see what we can do. He said it's ex extremely expensive, but, you know, it's like, what they say, what can you put on the, on the, on the cost right. of a yeah. life, yeah. Right. So that's what, what, that's why they started doing it, so, but it's, it's actually fairly uh, new, so, just in time. So we had the four blood moons yet? One. Only one, and all this stuff started already, wow. No, the last one will be um, like the end of next year. Oh. Yeah, but that may that may or may not be something we don't know for sure oh. because the claims that some of the people were making about them are not exactly accurate. It's kind of close, but not. So oh. there's a little bit of you know what I'm saying. Can I ask you what you mean about um, don't bring your trash to God? What tr what's trash? Okay. Um, what I mean by trash is your sin alone. Don't bring your sin alone to God. He wants your life. And I can't remember, there's a few scriptures that I was learning that, um, where he, he said, I bought a people, I purchased a people. You know, I did this for the people, not for their sins, just to, for them to go be free. That's not real freedom. Amen. The real freedom that he's talking about is freedom to do the will of God. Grace to overcome sin. You know what I'm saying? It's a big difference. And what people's false freedom in their mind is, you know, to do whatever you want. You know, it's like a woman marrying some man for freedom. You know, what if it has a lot of money? It's like, well, her, she might act like it, but her heart is not because she loves the man. She loves his money. She loves herself. She came at it with a selfish motive. People come to God with a selfish motive, and they use his word. They use all kinds of things that can be generated by the power of his word to do things that they care about themselves. That's wickedness. What were you saying? He said, freedom to follow God. And what, did, what was the other thing? Oh, that God, God, um, the cross was not just to purchase your sin, it was to abolish sin, basically, to, you know, pay for your sins so he could have you, you know, not so you could just, like, like a woman just coming to a man just so she can go live and do whatever she wants and cheat on him, you know, just because I love you, wife, you know, I want to be with you, you know. Okay. But another thing is, is that, um, in helping us to get the right perspective when it comes to dealing with with um, the body of Christ at large, who really does care about God, but they just don't know, okay? And that is to say that first comes the revelation of Jesus before they can consecrate themselves to God on that same level. You can't expect someone to, I mean, you would want them to because of what the Bible teaches, but it's hard for someone, if they have not seen the Lord, to, uh, to um, consecrate themselves to Him on that uh, significant of a level. Like, um, sanctification is about, like, I like my guitar. He sanctifies me from it and consecrates me to Jesus to be set apart for God to cleave to God. You get what I'm saying? Sanctification is leaving something, but
but not just for the, not for nothing. Just okay. Now I don't have it. See, I'm doing good. No, that's like will worship. He said, I didn't want you just to leave this. I want you to come to me now. To be, I want I want to be your hands and feet. I want you to be my hands and feet, kind of a thing. So um, we can't expect people to act different when they haven't seen different. So I think that the more we actually go through the veil and be examples, that God will be able to shine His glory and be able to move there and speak for Himself. You know, as we obey the Lord and go to that mercy seat on our own, which is not simple, I'm <laughs> making it something very, very hard sound very simple, but when we go there for real, in a new way, that God will be lifted up, the Lord will be lifted up, and He will draw the church consecrated to Himself. He does the work when we obey Him. The more we obey Him, it gives more power to the Lord. The more we just obey Him, it gives more power to the devil. And uh, praise God if we uh, obey God. <laughs> So, because if the devil takes an inch, he'll take a long ways. He'll he'll mess you up big time. For anybody out there who messes up, serious Christians who mess up, don't ever think that it's just I apologize and I'm good now. No, you don't understand the significance of sin. It's it's got a stain that needs to be washed out and dealt with. It's a big, it's a much bigger process than just I'm sorry, stop now. Like, no, you don't understand. The familiarity it becomes more severe. It's now you're more familiar with sin, and so it's going to take even more. Um, dis or more insulation away from that, or more dis distance from these things. Anything that smells like that needs to be away for a long time, so you can be very familiar with not being there. Otherwise, it becomes the sin becomes very familiar. It's just because you went there one time. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, don't worry. It'll become even more dangerous now because you're a little bit more familiar with it. Same with people of Israel when they come out of Egypt. It's like like you know, it was not that hard for them to make a golden thing because that's what they've known. It was very familiar to them. As soon as there's no authority, no fear of God, all of a sudden, instantly they're going back to idolatry and even calling it Yahweh, which they all knew it wasn't Yahweh, but that was familiar to them. So becoming a familiar with sin is exceedingly dangerous because you go there once, you're going to go there again. And like Wigglesworth says, God forgives one sin. He says that he doesn't hold one time against you. It's the second time because you knew what you were, you really, really knew what you were doing the second time. If that happens the second time, you better be abundantly cut off, like the hand cut off, the eye cut off. Don't cut your eye out for real, but you know what I mean. To really cut it off and to be that serious about it because it is that serious. Anybody who knows what I'm talking about, you can amen me later, but I'm just telling you it's true. It's that serious. It reminds me of um, remember hearing um, that man that I like to let one of was talking about a sermon and um, he was from New York City and he was talking about um, he was in the, like, in the middle of the, um, the square or whatever and he was praying that he was talking about lust and um, how there were billboards for women and stuff like that and he said um, if you look it's, if you see it and, and look once but don't look again or something like that it's the second time that you look is when you're in trouble it's like yeah, yeah. so basically yeah. what you're saying like you can tell you can you know you see something and then you know go back to look again and that you know what i'm saying so yeah. Yeah, that's the Amen. and not yeah. only men you have that problem us women have the same problem okay yeah. yeah men are always saying you women you women but we also do the same thing sometimes mm -hmm. so <laughs> you yeah. have men that dress in certain way, and it's just as revealing as women sometimes. Mm -hmm. and There's a spirit it. about it. You can feel the spirit about it. There was that woman at out, out by your house after we went over to your house several weeks ago. What woman? And some woman at McDonald's afterward. And Karen, oh. it's like, remember the scent of a woman? And uh, there's a big story behind the scent of a woman, which is really profound. Um, I'll tell it to you real quick. It's not that long, but it's a good story so you can get a grounding idea about it. And it was a um, TV show that I used to watch all the time. I was like obsessed with this TV show called Dinosaurs, and one was called A Scent of a, Di a, a Scent of a Lizard or something like that, instead of A Scent of a Woman, because a woman has a fragrance about her real spirit. It permeates and it attracts a certain type of people. So, um, I guess at a certain age, a scent gland comes into your skin, and it causes a fragrance. And she's like, oh, my scent gland came in, and so they're like in the hallway at school, fanning it down the hallway. And some men were walking down the hall, ooh, that's gross, ooh, looking at the bottom of their feet, thinking that's disgusting. So it wasn't the right guy. And that what it was attracting was some hillbilly guy, he was like scrubbing the floor, he was a janitor. So, ah, ah, and he was attracting, she's like, oh my goodness, no, this can't be my destiny, you know. But then, 
she uh, she realized she she heard that there's some type of potion you can make to rub it on your skin and wash away your scent gland and make it change. In case you don't like the man that you're attracting, you can change your scent. And it's this is really good. This is really good. I believe it can. I believe it's very. Um, I believe it matches godliness in a way. So hopefully you can hear this. I, I'm not sure the right way of connect, connecting them, but I do believe the story is very good. Is that a woman can change her scent into what she attracts by her, by her own spirit. But um, it was this thing called the MacGuffin Lily out in the middle of high mountains and blah, blah, blah. This is the only place it is in the whole world. And so this girl's like, I cannot live like this. I do not want to be attracted. I don't want to be attractive to a man like that because she was absolutely disgusted by this guy. And she's like, you know, didn't realize she should be disgusted with herself because that's her spirit that was attracting that guy. You know, like, why is this the only people that like me? <laughs> There's a reason for that. So we can change our sense. So she went out there looking for the MacGuffin Lily, and she gets there, and they had made a business out there, and they wiped them all out. Oh, the place was teeming, on them, teeming with them. Now they're all gone. And she's like, I need that thing. And she came back all depressed, like, how am I going to be stuck up marrying this guy? Oh, my gosh, are they kidding me? And then he comes back over to the house to hang out with the family and get to know everybody. And he's like, Pity you, you stink. What happened to your scent? And she's like, um, I don't know. I tried to change it, but it didn't change. And he leaves. And then her friend says, you tried to change it. You wanted to be different. And you, you gave your all to be different. And, and she did change. And so she no longer attracted this junk anymore. You know? And so it's an interesting thing to see, like, what what does get attracted to us, you know? And it's, sometimes I get down on myself, like all these people who are like, got great families, got all this stuff going on, and they don't even care what I have to say. Does that mean because I'm a, such an idiot or something like that? And I'm like, but would I be happy teaming up with that kind of stuff? When they're chilling out time, they're seriously just laughing at stuff on the television, I would throw up and die. <laughs> like that is not living to me, you know? So I don't have to feel down on myself. All I want to be down with, I want to attract people who are so serious about going further and further with God. That is the only thing that's attractive to me. That's the only thing that makes any sense because I have had revelation of the Lord and I can consecrate myself in that radical of a level. And if I have to leave people behind, so be it. I tried to tell them, but they didn't listen. My message has never changed and bless the Lord on my soul, it'll never change unless it goes deeper into God and leaving people even further behind. But thank God for a people that says, I want to go wherever he wants. And if you have a word for me, I'll listen. I want it. I want to know what I can do to go further with the Lord. Yeah. Amen. Now I understand you. What's that? You told me that story and I didn't get it. Oh, the first time? Yeah. The scent of the lizard? Yeah. If you want to be different, you will not attract trash. It sounds like what we were talking about before. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. This afternoon. Remember that? Yeah. I don't want to talk about it unless you want it. It's okay. Um, she was saying that she thinks that men consider her ugly, and so she doesn't attract them. But I don't even have a pet plan. <laughs> but the thing is, she was told she was ugly when she was young, and so that's a tape in her head, you know. That's not true. It's just a lie from the devil. So, other than that, I don't know what to say, but... How, uh, what's the connection here? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, kind of there's, there's, good men as far there's, as a, there's a spirit about a woman, okay? Like, we were at the McDonald's, and there was a lady in there that was just average-looking girl, you know, whatever. And um, she walked by, and she looked like just like um, a death trap. She just had this kind of spirit about her, like she was just looking at me like, like, um, you know what I mean? Just looking at me like, the sky is the limit kind of a thing. I don't want to say it any further than that, but it just did not look good. And I could tell that she was like bringing the flirtation very severely. You know, I'm sitting there with Gary and Kathy and just just looked at me like that and we could all feel it. It was just like a tidal wave of ridiculous walking by and goes to the restroom and comes back out and some just like redneck trap, tra whatever this dude was, he was unbelievable. But he was trying to like, oh, you got a husband? Oh, you've been divorced? Oh. Um, can I hug you? I mean, it was just ridiculous. She was putting off all these, like, men, I'm addicted to men vibes. Like, I'm so out of, I'm so off kilter. And so just, I mean, it was just bad. And Kathy's like, remember the scent thing? I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's getting a little smelly in here. You know, it was yeah. permeating the whole place with her just grossness to me. That's what it felt like to me. Yeah. <laughs> it was bad. Yeah, it was, it was pretty bad. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because yeah. there's other girls who dress in certain ways that's not appropriate, but their spirit does not make you feel like um, this is, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like a death trap. They feel like they're protected. They got a family. They got a boyfriend. They got some brains. They got some kind of a spirit that has boundaries. A woman with no boundaries is a woman that's sending out the wrong spirit. It's not about the physical attraction. That's a different. That's a different sermon. Yeah. But like, um, a spirit is like, I accept any trash that comes my way. Like, no, you have. You're a woman with standards. This is what it must be. It's the Lord's will. God will give me the right man, and I will know it's of the Lord. I'll have peace about it, and it'll be right on time. He'll be seeking the Lord just as strong or stronger than me. And you have, don't have to go out there looking for him either. <laughs> Right? No, you don't. <laughs> I you made know? that mistake. <laughs> because people people who go to like these places where there's all kinds of choices and stuff like that. It's like, are you sure God's leading there? You know, it's like maybe you jump into stage one, I'm a very immature believer, and then just God just get me married, you know? Like because if you're with someone who does not gel with you growing with the Lord, it's going to hinder your growth yeah. with the Lord. It's going to cause a lot of trouble. There's nothing oh, worse than being in a bad marriage, believe me. I've been I do. Them. I do. I believe you. <laughs> I don't know how I know. I just know. You're right. But uh, I hope that everybody got something from today's word. I think it yeah. was pretty solid. Yeah. I think it was pretty, um, really good word. And uh, yeah, I, just, I like this, what you said. If you judge yourself, you won't be judged. If you humble yourself, you won't be humbled. <laughs> that's really, that speaks to me. Mm -hmm. People, yeah, I heard someone was talking about like it didn't. I don't even. I didn't even feel bad or something like that. I just start. I just felt scared to tell you. And of course, I care, but just to hear this kind of thing about. Um, I don't fear sin. That's a very scary thing. When you know it's wrong, like we talked about last week, it's something that you know in your head is this has got to be sin. But yeah, I feel peace about it. That is scary. Oh yeah, yeah. you said that's that a serpent. Week. That's a serpent kind of getting around your yeah. neck, like kind of giving you some of that. And that one lady that told it kept, had a great testimony about that. In two years, she was doing drugs and living like a fool. And then it was after uh, doing drugs for two years after her born again experience, yeah. and didn't ignore all these thoughts. And all of a sudden, everything came collapsing down. And it's like, man, you know better than that, you know. A fool knows better than that to be doing drugs, smoking cigarettes and drinking trash, you know. Be pure for your Lord, man. Be, what, what, what God do you think you're going to see on the throne? A dumb God who doesn't know anything? He's holy. And it's a sham and a shame for believers to act like this is not coming. It's coming. And you're going to give an account to him for all your own life and all the people you were supposed to influence for the kingdom of God. That should cause you to be scared. I am scared. <laughs> Amen. I say I that am. I Amen. live like a fool for the Amen. longest time. I'm glad I'm waking up. <laughs> Praise the Lord. What were you saying? Oh, it reminded me of the, um, the drummer boy story. Uh, exactly. Being sober. Exactly. Not, a, not only like from his want to stay sober from um, drugs, you know, to be pure before the Lord, but I mean, we could go much further than that, you know, from what we watch and what we listen to and, you know, just our, our daily thoughts, staying sober from things that aren't supposed to be in our mind and, you know, stuff like that. So, Amen. So, Brian, I mean, we can be pure before the Lord now. Yeah. Okay. And my cousin tried to do that to me. She was giving me uh, Percocets every four hours. What's that? A pain, pain, pain pill. pill with oh. codeine and, and um, yeah. Tylenol. And I I took it and because she's in, oh, you got to stay away, stay above the pain because I wasn't feeling any pain. But mm. I took it and then I got dizzy and I fell. And I think later on that caused my big blues. Oh, okay, recently, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. she can't believe how I can be uh, handle pain. Oh. and have such joy during this time. And I don't know if I told you this, but during the time I was having the MRI, I was listening to the radio, and it was a Christian thing, and in I could hardly hear it because of the loud noise that the MRI produces. Mm -hmm. That's why they put headphones on you. It, it helps you distract you from the sound. Mm -hmm. And they were 
I was in the middle of a quiet time, so they then readjust and get a different picture of me. This all the sound, all the songs I could have picked, they picked Mac, Mac, Martina McBride's "I'll Get You Through This," and I've been going on those words through my whole surgery through this cancer. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would be so depressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, it's so great. And, it's, <laughs> and it's a testimony to my cousin. It's been a testimony to my cousin. She mm -hmm. can't believe how I can heal so quickly, handle so much pain, and be able to go to Texas on the 29th <laughs> after having two major surgeries. Mm -hmm. But it's the Lord. I give all the glory to the Lord for that. Amen. Amen. He's yeah. watching out for us. Yep, yeah. he's a good provider. <laughs> yeah. The van's rented out again. Oh, we really? Nice Pay people from California. Oh, well, uh, yay. <laughs> dark skinned folk, Catholics that came from the van and doing some family thing, birthday party thing. Mm. It's like, mm. no problem. Just give me money. <laughs> Just kidding. Are you asking really more nice. money since you know better now? Um, only for Hood to Coast. Hood to oh. Coast is a very um, big deal where. All the 15 passenger vans in the city are rented, so that means the, the value goes up. So other than that, just for people, no problem. Oh. 100 bucks a day, and that's a good price. Well, I hope you get a good price when that happens. It does. It, I do. I have a law firm that wants it, and I'm getting it in. in a, it's going to be my cash cow. Yeah. Uh -huh. I, I, I won't need roommates for that month, but I'm thinking about maybe doing that anyway, because I, whatever, either that or another job, because I would like to... Uh, Make sure I'm on top of my game and all my responsibilities. So, part of being a man is that you got to take care of stuff, and uh, and I like having stuff going on and having vehicles that's ready, you know, at any given time to help people move, to help move wood, all that different stuff. Do you guys see those little wood things? These are the things I was hoping to get, like a whole truckload of those. See those little wood, those round things? Oh yeah. Yeah, those little cylinder things. Those are um, from the wood mill that mm -hmm. I pick up from. They have these big old crates. It's at least a truckload, fifteen dollars for a truckload of these things. Oh, it's, a, it's the core of a tree. Oh. The cores of a tree. They they have like trees. What do they you cut do with them. Is there a light in there? No, they're they're just wood. They're just wood. Well, what do you do with them? Just like that. Just a decoration. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I would like to be able to do, do things with them, like write on them or make them into candles or something like that. And and then you could sell those if you could ever figure out how to cut a little hole for the tea light to fit on top of that and kind of mm -hmm. decorate it look cool. So if I start getting some ideas or even put scripture on them or something like that, mm -hmm. it's a good way to connect with people and have a nice simple little business or something like that. But mm -hmm. I like them. I think they're cool. I just love wood and they're clean so I don't have to worry about bugs. But I thought it would be really cool to make the whole room look mountainy and like lush, you know. I was talking to some gentlemen. Um, a lot of people in northeast Portland have their yards like this where they don't have grass in their front yard. It's like the curb, and then it's just like dirt and kind of fancy rocks and a lot of bushes and little trees and different. They're all different, and they're all pretty lush. So it's like, wow, everybody's got these lush little multi-planted things around. And really nice older guy talking to me about his plants. And it was funny because it was like um, I learned something too because he was talking. I was like, oh, what is this flower right here? And he's like, oh, oh yeah, um, that is. Uh, um, okay, hang on. Let me let me get into plant mode. <laughs> and what he did was kind of like how I preach. He's like, oh, okay, now this, but he, he started with what he did know. Okay, now this one is the dog ear one, that's, or the mule ear plant, and this one over here is the da 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 fern, and this one here, and he starts to get back to the flower. Um, okay, I can't remember still, and you know, and that's kind of how I am when I'm preaching. I was like, okay, I'm going to start with what I do know. I have a couple ideas from this week, and I'll start to go. And now I'm getting used to using those a little bit, so I, you saw me cheating today, but that's okay. Because at least I don't miss anything. And it doesn't break my flow. I'm getting used to it. It's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. That's going to make it a lot easier where I don't get so stressed out about people jibber jabbering and stuff like that. But um, it made me understand something that, like, um, he said, I need to get into plant mode, you know? <laughs> and when we're trying to, like, bring the gospel or a serious word, you have to bring something out there to prepare their mode for the mm -hmm. hearing of what you want to say, you know? Mm -hmm. You can prepare people. That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses always do, anyway. They're always like, you know how the Bible says, blah, 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 and they bring the scenario, and then they'll teach their little philosophies and stuff like that. And after a while of that, I, I, I learned enough what they think, you know. 
Because once in a while you hear some really strange things coming from their mouth, you're like... <laughs> no? <laughs> yeah, she hears one of them, she's like, Why are you not saying something wrong? And I'm like, it hurts less if you just let them talk it out and then... Well, know. I've never really yeah. had to deal with it. Yeah. Just, like, I was more, like, saying certain things. Like, look, you're not supposed to be saying this because of what I'm like, well, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I've never had to. So I'm just like, and he's all quiet, and I'm just not used to him being quiet. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Ye
when an angel, someone tried to worship him as a god, I'm not god, don't do that. Right, you know? right, so, right. Um, there was a lot of really good texts in there, and that's the one I would have used too, because that one's pretty clear, you know, where the, they worshiped him as god when he went up from the Mount of Olives. Yeah. Why would they do that? Because he was God. Right. You know, so people say, oh no, he was God's son, and the Father used him to create everything. I'm like, that's true, but he's also God. You know, the Father, the Son, and God, the Holy Ghost. And it is, on one hand, clear, and on one hand, it's a mystery. So he thought it not robbery to be equal exactly. with God. Equal. Plus, the in, it's somewhere in Hebrews or Revelation, it says that the angels worship Jesus. Mm. And so they're, they're, they would be disobeying the first commandment, not to bow down to another god, you know. <laughs> would God, why would God allow that in heaven? I can't imagine that. He's a holy God. <laughs> the right hand of the Father. Yeah. Now maybe when he was human, uh, he only did what the Father said. Right. But he just wanted to do that to show how we could do the same exactly. thing. To show God and how yeah. to obey Him and how to relate to Him. Yeah. Amen. And uh, he submitted to the Father then. And so people are like, oh, he must be less than him. I'm like, he just did that on purpose, you know? It's like a woman submitting to the husband. She's not less than the man. She's just playing her role, you know? And Jesus had to do the will of the Father that all righteousness could be fulfilled. That the Word would be fulfilled. Everything that the Lord spoke in the first place, this will happen. So this text is teaching that Jesus is Jehovah. Yeah. He is Jehovah God who opened up the Red Sea. He opened up his hands and said, it's finished. He's the same God. You know, it's not different. The Father is the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. So, interesting, huh? So in other words, when Moses asked, is it the true God? And he put him in the rock and he, and he saw his backside. Was that Jesus? In his glory. Okay. Jesus in his glory. See, like, you could describe Jesus as, um, Jesus, like, um, on earth could be recognized as a gardener, you know? You would not mistake God Almighty in his glory as a gardener or a baby. Oh, he's a baby, you know? Yeah. You could, you could mistake that if you're not looking at him correctly. Right. But, uh, those who did know, they came from a long ways to worship him as God. They bowed before the baby, Jesus. And yeah. he's worthy as Jesus, as a baby, to be worshipped as just a God-child. This is God. I mean, this is I am. Man, that's powerful. Remember that Mary Did You Know song? Yeah, I love Mary that song. You know? Oh, that song can make my hair stand up. <laughs> but yeah, he's God. So yeah, that had to, that that had to be. Um, it sounds weird. It's almost like it's like I can understand where they're coming from. The Father and the Son of the Father, who was Jehovah. You know, I can understand that. But so the Trinity, really interesting. It's really really interesting. It really is. Yeah, it's kind of confusing. In, in the New Testament, it seems clear that when you go to the Old Testament, it becomes kind of confusing to me. Even though he shows up sometimes, well, actually a lot of times, in almost every book he shows up as like the fourth man in the fire, they said he was in the likeness of the Son of God. Yeah, so that, yeah. of course, was Jesus. Yeah, some people don't believe that. Then. Some people, because of many versions and uh, different views and whatnot, and different notes and stuff, people think it's an angel. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a, it's starting to get kind of weird, you know. So I thank God for the uh, my history and being taught a lot of truth. It's just that a lot, a lot of it, like I say to everybody, it's like you do have a lot of truth, but when you take away the fear, a constant fear of God, you've taken away everything, in my opinion. And I love to worship God because I fear, I fear Him. You know, every time we sing these songs, I'm like, I love my life. This is so fun. People come in here yawning, like, oh, are you going to sing another one? I'm like, can we sing ten more? It's so <laughs> wonderful. Why would you want to stop singing? They're so good. Like, right. what are you going to do? Go home and do what? <laughs> Drink and watch TV? You know what I'm saying? It's like, that's, I can't, I don't, I can't even really fellowship with people when, uh, I've got one distracted from that church. I can't, it's just to sit there and have a serious conversation with people that I know how they're living outside is hard. You know, it's like, God, I don't know what to do. Should we suffer long, knowing they're never going to change? Or do I just cut it off, you know? <laughs> so we went to that Mennonite church last week um, to meet our friend. Oh. Um, his name, do you remember that guy? Um, Cody? No, Jake. Oh, the with, one with, with the all the kids? kids? Yeah, yeah. The bald, guy, bald guy. His name is Jake. And um, 
family's all out of town right now, but he was there, and I was like, hey, let's get together. I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time. And had, a, had an awkward conversation, quite frankly. It was just like um, all kinds of challenging at the table. Just a few of us, and we were managing to challenge each other on like pretty downright strong topics and stuff. So it ended up kind of getting uh, a kind of kind of challenging. And uh, but anyways, we grabbed this track. We have some tracks there. Um, this one's about Calvinism. Mm. <laughs> Calvinism and the scriptures. It's kind of interesting. It would be fun for us to sit there and listen to people talk about Romans 8 and 9. When it, I mean, and actually throughout the New Testament and probably through the Old as well, where it talks about the foundations of the earth, these things were set. Yeah. I mean, that kind of a thinking just doesn't compute. I'm like, God, I just don't get it, you know. Did I ask you, or I wanted to ask somebody uh, if you want to tell somebody on the street the proof of the resurrection of Jesus, what do you say? What do I say? Okay. There's, um, what I do, like, kind of like Finney does, whenever he's teaching something, he says, this is what it's not. Okay. But in the same kind of light, it's like, um, there's five major arguments against the resurrection of Christ. Mm. And, um, so I heard this guy teaching on it, which we should listen to sometimes, because I can remember, I think I can remember at least one of them, that that right there was enough. And that uh, was that the disciples, they were, they, they didn't know, okay, that Jesus was going to die. He well, said it to them they multiple didn't times. <laughs> they didn't understand it. They really, in their own understanding, they didn't know that he was going to die. So when he did die, they were like, they were dead, they were over. They're like, my life is over. You know, I gave my life to this guy, now he's dead. So they obviously didn't know he was going to die. So the fact that they didn't know he was going to die, and the fact that they ran when, they, when the persecution came, and then they seen him when he was resurrected. Resurrection, I call it the doctrine of all doctrines. We are to be pitied more than among all men if Christ did not rise. But he did. Yeah. So they said, okay, um, he says, if these boys were not willing to, they were, they said, we'll die for you, Lord, but then when it came to it, they ran to the person yeah. they come back. Reality hits, we're gone. But they had to fulfill the scripture, so that's part of it too. But anyway, to stick on track, they ran when they didn't know, and then they stood there and were willing to get crucified upside down, stoned, beheaded, and everything else because they did know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just the fact that they were willing to die because they saw Jesus rise from the dead, if it was someone else or someone else died or whatever, whatever. Jesus did die. He had stuff in his hands, his feet. I mean, his bear in his side. His, yeah, he had all the evidences of this is me. I'm Jesus. I was risen again, and they knew him. He was taken away, and they ran for their lives. In fact, they even even he denied Jesus. You know, so to say that he didn't rise again just by the way that they acted, they were absolutely fearless to death. Every one of them, except John. Yeah, that's pretty radical. Even even Paul got beheaded. Because well, John was world and oil. He just survived, but that was the only difference. Right. No, he got, had a different plan for him, right. but he didn't get martyred. But still, he was... He, per, he not, suffered. <laughs> oh, he suffered it a different way. Yeah, yeah the yeah. longer way. So, but he got the revelation of... Um, revelation. Right. Praise God. So, um... That's pretty radical. I mean, if you think of um, all the other religions and, um, you know, other people that they put on a pedestal have never resurrected, you know, yeah. um, any of the other gods, or Muhammad, or, like, nobody's ever done that. Mm -hmm. Those are just mortal, not God. You know? Right. They're yeah. all dead. Mm -hmm. They're all dead. Only one Sacred. leader conquered yeah. death. Yeah. Only one leader conquered death, yeah. which is a miracle. Yeah. God raised him. And in some ways, scripturally, you can even say that he raised himself. Yeah. So that's I'm, kind of interesting. I'm trying to write a, tra a track where this man comes to the Lord via the proof of the resurrection. Amen. Because it's the only thing that stands out from all the rest, mm -hmm. Amen. more than anything. I mean, yes, Jesus is God, but uh, all these other people claim all kinds of things too. Yeah. You know, and it kind of, it's too much. You know? yeah. So I, I think, you know, if I concentrate on the resurrection, Amen. there is no other way. Mm, there, nobody on. else has that. Amen. And so I'm trying to it is so true. find out you just, what I can The write. five major attacks, which I'll teach to you, I'll, I'll get that down next time, okay? okay? And I'll teach you the 
proof that they're not true. Like the proof of, oh, they stole his body. I'm like, they weren't even willing to, they, were, they weren't even willing to live for him while they, while they thought he was dead. Yeah. You know, they knew he was going to die. They wouldn't even stand for him then. But then after having his body, the Roman law would have killed them. And so you think that they're going to, like, I mean, stealing his body. It's like they weren't even willing to live with him while he was alive. How much more would they be willing to risk their life when he was dead and not knowing he was going to come back? Right. It makes no sense. So that's kind of, it totally annihilates this thing. Oh, they stole the body. I'm like, no, they would not steal the body. They were scared. Plus the Roman guards, in, you know, they're supposed to be sleeping well. They, they would never sleep on duty because they'd be killed themselves. Right. So they, we know because of that that they feared the Roman law. I don't know how people know that, but if that's true, the fact that they were not willing to stand while he was alive, why would they do it when he was dead? They would not risk their life when he was dead, not knowing he would come back. Right. So resurrection, I call it, I have a video, it's called the doc. you've heard it? Yeah, you heard I it, have right? it on It's very good, huh? Yeah. The doctrine of doctrines, and I also go into like this, because when I was about 18 years old, I said to my dad, I said, Dad, how do you believe? And he says, okay, I'll tell you how I believe. He says, Jesus Everybody knows historically he lived, whether they believed he was God or not, whatever. They don't, everybody has different views about him, but they all know he did live. But the truth is, is that these, these apostles, they were willing to die for him because they knew he was real. And I said, now that makes sense. If you're willing to die for somebody, you must know that that is real. So that gave me a hope or some type of like, okay, I get, I get it. That does make sense in the natural. And so it was just a matter of time before I put that Carmen CD on. And the Holy Spirit did his first, his first work in my life. And I said, whoa, this is real. And I totally get it. Something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me whole. Whole in a miracle now. way. The <laughs> king made me whole. The Lord's Spirit made me whole. So I knew when I was 18 years old, mohawk, shaved head, lots of punk shirts, dressed like a fool. But I was so a babe in Christ, but it was real. My spiritual connection to God was real. Yeah. But on that Carmen CD, Tape, tape back in the tape days, over and over, and the Holy Spirit showed up every time, saying, "That's Robbie giving his best." And once in a while, guess what? God's gonna actually ask for more. And when he, when, when baby state doesn't work, a lot of people fall there, and I did, because yeah. I didn't know you had to walk with the Lord further. If you don't do what He says, you're not gonna have it. You pop the CD, Lord, here, show up now. This is our schedule. He doesn't do that after baby state. He expects you to, to listen and learn more. So that's a lot of people fail there. Like, I don't know how I used to have this great walk with God. I don't know what happened. It's just all dead now. That's because you got to walk where he's telling you to walk. If you don't walk in the will of the Father, you will not have spiritual reality. And you'll be succumbing to all these lukewarm preachers, which is very prevalent in America, in all sorts of forms. Yeah. And I've heard, I've heard the rhetoric a million times, and I tell you, I've never changed on my position on just about anything at all. Everything that pops up, I'm like, I fight against it, and I get all whatever, because they, they seem like they can biblically prove me wrong. But I'm just like, you know what, Lord? I know you. I know God. So why would I fear what man can say or do when they don't even know God? You know? He says, I want you to be my witnesses. He means uh, you can tell people how you know me. Not go out there and be like the Jehovah's Witnesses, uninspired, as they say, and tell people what their biblical view is. That it's not biblical. Go around the world and tell me, this is our biblical view. Be a part of this biblical view that's uninspired, and now you're part of the body of Christ. That's nonsense. That has nothing to do with the book of Acts. And shame on the Baptist for acting just the same. This is our biblical view. All the spiritual stuff is over now. Yeah, that's where that's I was, law. That's where a lie. I was saved in the Baptist church. Not all Baptists are like that. There are some Baptists that know the Holy Spirit. God bless those people who, who still preach regeneration and true justification by faith. But faith cometh from hearing, you know. There's something that has to be groundbreakingly real to even remotely match Acts chapter 2 at all. Because that was a groundbreaking to no end. Man, it's a scary book. I read that and I, I, I wrote that sermon called Pentecostal Pie. You, should, you can watch that too. About all the pieces have to be there, you know. The fear of God, miracles, peace among your enemies, um, people dying for lying in the presence of God. It was a true, mighty revival of the people of God. The beginning of the New Testament church. And you telling me that, that people can act different than that and say this is still revival? I'm like, you don't know the Holy Spirit, you know, at that one church we were going to a while ago and something was weird going on. They started like rocking out in a funny way and I'm like, whoa, what is going on? This is dark. I'm like, ooh, this is revival. Come on, brother. Because I used to always be jumping around and just, just having a great time like a child. Like, they, that was very, 
rambunctious in church. It's wonderful getting to enjoy all that work and ministry when I don't have to do anything and just jump in there and I'm all happy and <laughs> excited. But they started doing some strange things in there and I'm just like, I don't understand what's going on, so I can't really get into this. Oh, okay, brother, okay. And I'm just like, man, what's going on here, you know? Too many little stuff slipping in there. And because of all the people pressure, I'll tell you the one thing will never happen, there'll be, there'll be no people pressure here. Because I'll just keep saying the same thing I've been saying for year after year. I've beheld the King in His glory, and I know what I'm talking about, and I'll never, ever change. You know, nobody will change me. You can't change me. He's already changed me. No man will change me. Unless you can do like Wesley and all these other great men of the ages, if you cannot be like them and further in the same spirit that woke my heart up and, and changed me and gave me everything I've ever been looking for. If you can't show me more of the same spirit, then your, your words are just, just talk. Just talk. Because what I got is beyond talk. It's a miracle. God's words is a miracle. The impossible. He's a God of the impossible. So people start talking about God and just, just, oh, he doesn't care about that. It's like, well, you haven't met the God of the impossible because your God is just in your imagination. He leaves you just the way you are. But God loves me too much to leave me the way I am. And he loves everybody too much to leave them the way they are. If they will listen to the guy in the Holy Spirit, it will be a, a work. It will be a faith that leads you into the works of righteousness. But not by the works of the law, but by the works of righteousness. By faith, because you listen to him. Now there's a pastor who spends hours in prayer and says, The Lord tells me what to do. And I walk there. I build the church because he told me to do it. And it flourished because God was all over it. Another man says, I tried to copy what you did and start a church and it failed. I went bankrupt in my life as a man. God honors you, but he doesn't honor me. He says, you don't understand. I don't just copy people. I don't just copy what the book says. I listen to God like the book tells you to do. Everybody in the book from top to bottom, they heard from God and they obeyed or they didn't and they got busted. And so today we need to hear from God and not get busted. We need to live revelatory like they did who did right. And today we need to live for, listen, for, listen for the revelatory word today and do right before God now. And if we're not, we're not biblical, because that is biblical, to hear God and to do what he says to do. That is the power of God resurrected on this life. And it deals with everything that needs to be dealt with, says the Lord, in our life. That's righteous. That is biblical. Justification comes by faith that comes from hearing that is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I didn't see it, but I sure didn't know it. <laughs> because when the, when the Lord does speak in the glory of way, at that mercy seat with the cherubim there and the Shekinah glory comes there. Trust me, I do know what that means and I have experienced it and I'm telling you, I can't remember what I was going to say. Where was I going with that? That's okay. <laughs> but that is not, that is not something, that's not something on pages alone. And so if I can hear him, this, this mighty king of glory on that mercy seat and his blood if I will listen to this Lord, He will open up the doors when He's ready. But I need to go through my time of testing. So I can be a solid leader and not fall. I want to be solid for the Lord and do all that He wants me to do. And no matter what it costs, He knows I will not disobey Him. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm talking about. That's what's going to happen, man. I'm excited. It's, it seems stupid. If people, I sometimes picture what I'm doing in the eyes of other people and imagine how stupid I look. But I'm like, look... Oh, you don't look you don't. stupid. Where do you get that idea? Because, like, I have such a tiny little group of people, you know, and people who know me, they know I'm telling the truth, and they still don't even pay attention hardly at all. And it's like I can use that as, like, well, no one even cares about what you're doing. Nobody, nobody who's rich goes to your church. Nobody who's this and this and this. I'm like, you know what? I think everybody who, who has a lot of strengths, they should make their own church and take care of people. Well, then you know you're just saying? going to be another Joel of the Thank okay. you. Thank you. Amen. Or you can be you because the Lord yeah. made you you. Yes. Did you ever I hear have that? Another question. <laughs> oh yeah. Mind. <laughs> no. Yeah, we're yes. good. I have this problem where you know I'm listening my whole heart. I'm totally interested, and somehow or another, without me realizing it right away, something takes over in my mind, and I'm somewhere else. And it takes quite a while sometimes to catch myself. And by that time, I've missed who knows how many minutes mm -hmm. of either you or Robert or somebody talking. And what can I do about that? Yeah, it's, I don't know how to describe it. It's different for everybody, you know. I mean, I, I have the same problem, too. Like, I drift all over the place, you know, trying to pray and then start thinking about things. And I'm just like, I don't know, you know. Ultimately, 
if the moment of glory ever happens where the Lord does shine light for you to see something in your own world that doesn't measure up to plain, obvious truth, that you're willing to agree with truth. The more you do that, the more free your mind will be to be protected. You know, the more you'll be under his wing, okay. and under his wing is freedom. It's just like clear. Everything's so clear, you know. And sometimes when you start getting foggy, you're not, you're not being careful about your steps and stuff like that. Things become foggy. Easy things in the spirit are very difficult in the natural. Waking up in glory, ha, ah, hallelujah. Lord, I'll seek your word, praise you, Lord. I love you. I come humbly before you. I love your word. I love you. Thank you for your blood, Lord. Give me a new day. Give me a new mind. And other days you're like, I can barely get out of bed. I'm barely making it to work on time. And it's just like you're sludging, you know. Spiritual affects everything, especially for the truly born-again Christians. Super serious Christians. Got to be very, very sober, very careful about what we allow in our spirit, our steps, our decisions in life. All have to be very, very careful. Uh, and it will slow you down, make everything very difficult. So I'm just saying for anybody and everybody, whether listening or your prayers or anything, everything will get flowing smoother in the right direction as we realize that this is a very slow building process of a lot of very difficult truths that we have to face and follow. For us personally, everybody's personal between the Lord and the Holy yeah. Spirit, yours and everybody else in the planet who's serious about God. Their only dealing is all going to be very individual, just like the difference between your fingerprints to the next your brothers and sisters. They're different. Same with the Holy Spirit's dealings. Very personal, very exact, and very specific to your dealings. So whatever the Lord's got for your next stage, that and everything else will start to get smoother. You know, you'll start to like be flowing in the Spirit, be able to share the love of God at the right time in the right way, not by some like, I have to go through these three stages, and otherwise it didn't really count. That's letter, that's trash. You know the truth. That's childlike faith. You know how to plant the seed, and if they don't reject it, then you know to back off. Force feeding doesn't do any good, right? So we test the waters a little bit. You know, I had a good conversation with somebody, and I was, I'm kind of prepared in case somebody ever tries to challenge me. He says, Robbie, you can't be witnessing on your job. I'll be like, I'd never do, unless they bring it up first. I wait for them to say something like they're trying to witness to me, and then I'll tell them, like, yeah, man, I've been touched by God. I run a little a house church. Oh, you must know a lot about the Bible, blah, blah, blah. And then we get to talking about stuff, and, and I, you know, pop them a card if I feel like it's the right time for that. So I can never say, have you ever given uh, a tract or card or anything like that to anybody? Um, by trying to bring up the subject of it, never. They bring it up, and I just chime right in, in, that, in a natural, kind, fair way. Because we switched out of work mode and started, they, they brought up the spiritual. They wanted to get personal and start talking about the spiritual things. Then I'll jump in. Because I honor the job. I'm working for the business. The business is not for me to preach on my time. It's for me to do the job. And so if I'm on the job and the, person, the customer wants to ch ch chat about something, I will listen. So I keep myself clean on that. So I like to keep everything dialed in. So the more I learn, the wiser I get. I make a mistake. I learn from my mistakes so I can become more and more solid. God's pruning me, you know, and giving me a little bit of a timeout, getting things, getting to shake out the rugs a little bit, shake out the sheets a little bit, air things out a little bit, and then the next wave is going to be more and more. You know, opportunities will start coming, and radical challenges coming. Bigger opportunities, bigger satanic attacks. Worst attack ever is that careless thing, oh, everything's free, all this freedom. Like, that's nonsense. It's not the true freedom. It's not true freedom. Shoot, there's one more thing in here. Oh! I did forget one. It's called the Thought I Knew Him trick. The Thought I Knew Him trick. I don't know how. I should watch that original video to see if I can remember what I meant by that. And what kind of like juice was flowing there. The Thought I Knew Him trick is like people telling you you know God before you meet God. You know what I'm saying? Like John MacArthur. And uh, just, to, just for the record, I don't know my right wording when talking about preachers that I don't agree with um, totally. Because I catch myself saying things against John MacArthur all by myself in my mind, and I can feel the Lord getting to me, saying, you better be careful, okay? I'm not saying that, I, I mean, I see the things that don't add up. I, I don't sense um, the presence of God the same way I like to when I hear him talking. And my point about him in this note is that when I listen to him, I feel like I need him to confirm my walk with God. Not that I have my own walk with God. I need him to tell me I have a walk with God. That's kind of what I feel like when I listen to him preach. I'm like, I don't fear. It's kind of like what I feel in, in certain of the other groups, that are more traditional groups. I feel like I fear not fitting in with this 
religious click more than I fear not being right with God. That's wow. a, that's a very dangerous thing. So that's they teach a bad it. thing. Wow. It's very dangerous. It's called the thought I knew him trick. So they they are the ones telling you you know God. God did not tell you you know me and I know you. Your relationship to God is through another person. That's literally what that is. Mm -hmm. So I don't know the right way. For God forgive me if I'm not saying it right because I don't want to bad talk people that are are godly men. In other words, you're saying John MacArthur is actually an idol. An idol? Hmm. I'm not going to say it. All I'm going to say is what I can say. All I know is that if I don't say the right words when, when bringing up my, my concerns with what I feel and sense from that kind of preaching, I get concerned and I don't know what the right words to say. So I'll just say, you know, thank God for all the good that he does. That's my best way. I learned that from Kent Holland. Thank God for all the good that he does. You know, he's talking about Billy Graham. But he says that he said some things that's not right. He said that, and that's not right. But thank God for all the good he's done. <laughs> so just so you know, lovingly, whenever you hear me say, thank God for all the good they're doing, God bless them for all the good that they're doing, I'll tell you what I really mean by that. Run, don't listen to them. Okay? Well, that's what I mean by that. Because you guys don't know me well enough. Whenever I say, hey, thank God for all the good they're doing. Because I don't want to talk bad about them. I don't want to let, I don't want that, that bickering spirit in my spirit, you know? I don't want that complaining kind of spirit in my spirit. Thank God for all the good they're doing. But I, I don't agree with their, some of the things doesn't, I don't understand. I'll just leave it like that. Thank God for all the good that this, this kind of preaching that he's doing. But um, there's enough missing that makes me remember where I used to be. Believing those kind of teachings that left me in bound in sin. And then I watch other people and I'm like, okay, are you bound in sin calling him a man of God? My Bible says you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. You know, but it doesn't mean he's not saying the truth. It just means something ain't right. When I listen to him, it turns off my restraining that I have that came from the fear of God. I restrain myself on purpose to not be just willy-nilly with things that's not appropriate. You know what I'm saying? So I just leave it alone. But I just say when I listen to that, I can feel all that God has built in me turning off. Oh, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. You're sealed till the day of redemption. You're sealed. You, 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 nothing can take you away from the love of God. That's right. Nothing can take you away from the love of God. <laughs> but you can, you can turn away from God, and, and I, I do not believe that. I heard some guy that was saying a lot of really good truth, an old man that's really popular. That's how you can always know they're popular, because they, they don't believe one. They believe once saved, you're always saved. If you believe that, you'll be a very popular preacher. And I'm not that way. I don't. It's not true. And um, anybody who believes that, I believe you don't have true revelation of God. You know, like John MacArthur says, I've never had anything happen. All I know is that God, when I came, I gave my life to God. This is what he says. I gave my life to God, and I, and I stopped wanting to smoke and do all these other worldly things. And I'm like, okay. I sat at a table for three hours talking to an atheist who did the same thing. He gives absolutely no glory. I mean, he, John MacArthur does give glory to God, but this person, it kind of is the same thing to me. When I talk to people who don't talk about the fear and awesome presence of God, walking in that spirit, we're supposed to be walking in the spirit, you know? And so a lot of the things that these people say, uh, Baptist persuasion a lot of times, and reform and whatnot, they, they try to eliminate the supernatural. I'm like, from their doctrines, I'm like, yeah, you should eliminate it because you don't have that. But the body of Christ does walk by that spirit. And there are prophetic words that will come. And there are healings that will come. There are utterances that will come. And you don't have to understand them. And not all the time is it in madness. It's not always wrong to do tongues. It's only one time in the Bible that ever warns you about this will sound wrong. And that's to the unlearned and the unbelievers. That's it. So when unbelievers come in there, don't just carry off in tongues. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Use your brains a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Amen. Makes sense, huh? Well, God wants everything orderly. Right. And to people who aren't in believing in tongues, it looks a little strange. Right. A, a little. Yeah. <laughs> a whole bunch of strange. Yeah, it looks, it I looks mean, I went to a place where I was a Christian, but I didn't have, have the tongues gift. And this preacher says, okay, everybody praise God in tongues. And I felt left out. Yeah. Because I couldn't speak his tongues. No, so I just did it in English. Yeah, but that's not why. That's not... That's not what I don't even know. I don't that's even know. I don't even believe that everybody's actually, as many people are saying that they have, they just don't actually have it. 
Yeah. That's what I believe. Well, it, it, it makes sense. Because it says there's, not, there's always different giftings. <laughs> and it's like, why is the only gift that's so pushed is the gift of things that can be made, can be man-made? You get what I'm saying? Yeah, I've heard what about gift of miracles? In the occult, they also have the gift of tongues. They do. Who? Catholics speak in tongues. There, there's, there's tongues in every, there's every, every section. So, um, I, I'm not opposed to tongues. I'm, I'm totally good with tongues. If I, I, but I know the Holy Spirit. So if there's things going on, and you, you want to be delivered from your sin, you want to be delivered from your this and that, but you don't want to be delivered from, you know, you, people who want to be delivered from problems, but they don't want to be delivered from their, their disobedience, then no. So to me, your tongues is no better than a Hindu speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. Holiness or hell? Holiness or hell for everybody, whether, whether you heard it for the first time or for the rest of your life, holiness or hell, without which no man shall see the Lord. Without holiness and that love of the brethren or whatever that scripture says, no man shall see the Lord. And the holiness is not just legalism. It's not just being separate. It's not separate for no reason. It's separate to be consecrated to the Lord and what listening to the Holy Spirit. Huh? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. What was the title of the thing that you wrote down when you started talking? The message? Title? Like, you said, oh yeah, I left one thing out and then you said it. What oh, the thing I left out was called the thought I knew him trick. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was thinking about that, and I think what you're talking about is no different from, um, like, Roman Catholic or any other religion out there. Yeah. We're talking about a certain sect, but I think there's a lot of different religions out there that do that. And I think it has to do a lot with what I was trying to tell you that one time about um, people see a leader that they kind of fit into what they're doing. They're either raised and born in that um, in that area or something that just attracts them normally, like somebody might be attracted to go to a Roman Catholic church and because the leader tells them something like in order to be Catholic you gotta make sure you do this. Mm -hmm. Come in line and get the little what a wafer thing and put it in your mouth and you know, and mm -hmm. sit on your knees and pray and then get up and do the chant or or whatever. So, um, for some reason, I, I, I don't still don't understand why. Maybe it's just, um, maybe it's just uh, the lust of the, the flesh, of seeing something fleshy that attracts me to this religion, or, or something that um, makes me say, okay, well this guy's in charge, so he must know what he's talking about, and mm -hmm. if he says I do this stuff, then I know God, you know. Mm -hmm. Or, you yeah, know, we've yeah. been to diff a lot of different, we've, <laughs> we've been to a lot of different churches, and, and it's like, if I put these clothes on, or if I put this little thing on my head, or if I, you know, if I have a beard, or don't have a beard, or whatever they say, because they know God, and I don't, you know, coming into it, I can know God if I follow these steps, and maybe one day I'll be where they're at, or something. Oh, uh, yeah. Colossians. Colossians. I'll, I'll read it to you if I can find it, okay? Yeah. So I it. still don't know which, what you mean with the thought I knew him trick. Like what mm -hmm. we're just talking about, like when you go to a certain place, they don't teach you the true revival steps like I was talking to you about last week. Yeah. And you were kind of going through those things so you can have your own personal breakthrough. Now, I, I won't even be in the room. I won't even know like whatever this is between I'll, I'll say this is what sister I believe you're going to need to do for your next step in the Lord and I'll teach people how you can personally know the Lord not me telling you these are the natural steps you can take if you will dress like this if you will do this certain thing now you can know like you know Muslims you have to pray towards the east or whatever five times a day or whatever you know like that doesn't deal with the heart you know right. what I'm saying it's all outward Right, right, right. And, it's, and it's in Colossians it says it has an outward, it has a show. God, where is it at? Form of godliness, but denied. That's a, that, that one fits too, but there's one in Colossians that that's, it's really, it really hits home for kind of what I've been, um, well, it's before Thessalonians, I can't remember. I'm thinking, it's cool. Colossians, okay. And I'll show you this text here. Man, I was preaching good all in my head. I was practicing standing right here earlier. And some cool things bumped in my head. And 
I think most of it come out. Praise God. It's exciting when God moves in here. Amen? <laughs> Amen. You can feel it. You feel Him every time. Whenever He wants to get a blessing us like that. I have that. I'm going to look it up real quick. Will worship. That's the, that's the word. It's called will worship. Which I was talking about earlier. I think I mentioned that earlier in the, in the word. Two twenty-three. Let's go. Two twenty-three. Did things have to do with a show of wisdom and worship? Two twenty-three. Yes. Very what? good. Two twenty-three. Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show. These have a show of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in honor, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. He calls it a show. A show of what? Oh yeah, um, Colossians 2.23. Yeah, but I mean a show of what? Show of wisdom. Oh, okay, I get it. It looks wise, but it, it looks isn't. right, right. Okay. So if you're really not wise and you want to look wise and in control a billion people, put on a big white hat like that. <laughs> big fish hat. You'll be well, good to go. It's, uh, I mean, we laugh, but it's like, it's pretty amazing how many people um, think that's the way. I mean, because I, I know people in my family that um, they do these things out of um, religious acts and it's like they think they know God because they're doing certain things. But when you go to their um, their home, they have the statue of Mary here. And on the other side, they have all their tequila bottles and all the yeah mm -hmm. horrible. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Like, but it's intermixed and it's yeah. and it's nothing that they're going what they're going to doesn't it doesn't deal with their heart or their sins or anything. It's yep. just you do no. these things and you're going to be okay. You know, you pray to Mary or. Yeah. And uh, you listen to whatever he tells you to do, and you're fine, you know. And then they don't have doubts about it. And right. Yeah, they don't. They literally think that people who tell you to repent. I just have so many doubts. <laughs> people who tell you to repent, they'll think you're legalistic and stuff like that because they've been told by men. But they've been, they've learned that from men. I'm like, God did not tell you that you, that, you know, the thought I knew him trick. I, hey, I thought I knew him, you know. Well, how did you think you knew him? Because I went to this service and they told me that. It's like, well, there's a lot of services out there and they don't agree with each other. So you might want to find the one that actually can tell you how to find God and God can tell you that you know Him. God. It's, it's like going to the Seven Day Adventist Church where my mom used to go. Mm -hmm. I went with her out of politeness, you know. I'm staying with her, so I'm going to just go. It doesn't matter. I'll just sing the beautiful songs at least to nothing. Yeah. You know, and, and so. We go there, and some lady notices me that, you know, I'm my mother's daughter, and she, and the first thing she asks me is, do you go to church on Saturday? Yeah, yeah. I mean, but you can honestly say yes. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. that day, yeah, but that's not <laughs> what she meant. <laughs> right. you know? yeah. And it's like, what happened to brotherly love and, and pleasing so the Lord so with true. your heart? So and, true. You know, I, I was like, it's yeah. all about this one thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they said that if you go to church on Sunday, that's called the mark of the beast. Yeah, my mother told me if I don't repent from going to church on Sunday, that I will eventually become part of the war of Babylon. So I eventually I thought that too, and I said to myself, if I now, on the basis of what she tells me, 
repent from going to church on Sunday and start going to some church on Saturday for that reason, then I'm doing a work salvation type thing. Well, for that reason right there, I'm not going to go to church on Saturday yeah. the way she wants me to. Doesn't that, doesn't yeah. that fit perfectly in? Thought I knew him, you know. Yeah, that's but what you're, fit in. you're fitting in with the people, with what, what they said. Yeah. Not you're not fitting in with what God led you to do. If God's not leading you, it's not faith. You get no, what I'm saying? I'm just doing it out of fear for uh, my mother. Very quick, yeah. <laughs> you're, the, the people pressure you to act a certain way, and that becomes your Holy Spirit. That's not the Holy Spirit. It, mm -hmm. it matters why you do what you do. Yeah. You know, those well, that worship right. Him in spirit and in truth. They will change because they love God, not because, oh, they have to to fit in with their group, you know. And I'm not convinced that everybody in these certain groups like this um, know that. I don't know that they all know that. And uh, God bless them if they do. Huh? I said it again. God bless them for all the good that they do, but I don't know who knows God and who right. doesn't, you know. Yeah, that's for God to determine. And so, but, you know, this, at the same time, though, I'm being with a little fruit inspector. Because I don't want to go to church on that basis that they're telling me. Oh. So right. for me, I, I have to say no. Because it would go against my conscience. What I understand from God's word. You see what I'm saying? Oh, let's say that again. Okay. If I go to church on Saturday because my mother tells me oh. that if I don't, I'll become part of the war of Babylon, mm -hmm. then... Uh, to me, at least that's my impression, then I would start basing my salvation on what I do yeah. instead of what what uh, the Lord has done for me. <coughs> and, you know, He's never guided me to go to church anywhere on Saturday. It's not this church. It's, it's, mm -hmm. I don't care. I go to both now. It doesn't right. matter. Right. It's just that doing something in order to be saved, mm -hmm. that's what it boils down to. Because I don't want to be part of the we're in Babylon. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever that well, means. Well, I do believe people should walk in change, but as the Spirit leads. You know, and as your children, of course, you got to listen to your parents. Yeah. But as you get older, and you need to be able to fly on your own, and you have to have your faith on your own. Yeah. And you should have it earlier on, of course, too. And hopefully they're leading you in that way, not just by rules. But they have to protect you from acting like a fool sometimes and doing stuff that's going to hurt you, of course. But that's, that's one thing. That doesn't mean that salvation, keeping you out of trouble, is not salvation. Salvation is away from sin and in God. Yeah. Abiding in Christ is right. not, you know, to leave sin to not abide in Christ is still not really what it's all about. Yeah, it's really a strange world. I mean, there's just, yesterday I put in a laptop a comparison of founders of religion. Man. There must be 40 founders of religion or more. It was a huge list. <laughs> it's a whole bunch I never even heard of before. You know. There's a lot more than 40. Uh, yeah, well, anyway, mm -hmm. the list was probably around that, but there's probably more, and I don't know about it. Yeah. That was one of these search engine uh, encyclopedia oh, type things. Yeah, yeah. I forget what you call it. Uh -huh. it but anyway, <laughs> I, just, I was going to do a comparison of a few founders in that track, but it's just not possible. It won't work. <laughs> so, too many, huh? Yeah, too many. <laughs> My goodness. Yeah. Oh, the God, uh, the, there's, um, I have a ma manuscript Bible, and uh, the, the several proofs of a scripture is papyrus, the unicles, the mythicals, the ancient uh, scripture and fathers, God fathers or something of the church. I don't know if that's the, of the church or just like Ignatius and Pilot Carp. They're, they're considered fathers. Oh. I don't know if they're, that's talking about that or what. Uh, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> what, what do you mean? Like. Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John, right? And he said certain scriptures or quoted scriptures, so because he quoted it, it supports the manuscripts in the Bible. It, 
and some of them aren't so good. I've I've been listening to some things on how we got our Bible. Um, kind of like that lady, I can't remember her name, that's really big one. Yeah, Jill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if those people are in terms of religion because they preach the Bible. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Some of those early four, uh, early fathers of the, of the Christian faith, I am not like indefinite about which ones I am in with and not. You know, I mean, the disciple of John sounds pretty solid to me. Yeah, And then absolutely. there's another guy. There's another one called Origin. Oh yeah, and he's not so good. Origin. I, I've heard, I've heard um, good, good things about him oh. and a little bit of bad. But the good thing about Origin um, was that he was kind of like coming away from, you know, where Calvinism and Baptists and stuff like that come from, where you don't have to do anything, you don't have to, you don't have to obey, you just have to believe and live however you want. You know, earlier on it was, um, um, you know, today we have Baptists versus Pentecostals. They both think they're not saved. And then before it was Calvin versus Armenian, right? And before that it was Pelagian versus um, I mean, no, no Pelagius versus um, oh, what the, the, uh, the confessions of Augustine. Augustine was the oh, one yeah. who was Augustine. heavily involved in um, what is it called? That Gnostic, Gnostic kind of gospels or something like that. So he says very few people go be beyond Augustine. They don't go before that and find out that there was issues even before that. I mean, and you'll see right. Wasn't he the starter and the original starter of the Catholic Church? Who's that? Augustine? Augustine, um, no, Constantine. Oh, Constantine. Constantine was the first pope. Oh, okay. They all say, the, they, they believe that he went before that, but whatever, they say a lot of things to make them look like, we're the originals. Uh -huh. And I always tell people, nobody's the original until you've gone to Calvary and died and found God. Because until you go through this true process of self-denial and understanding that you are a sinner and do what God tells you to and God be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm a sinner. I have sinned in both issues. I'm a sinner and that I've sinned. Both things, my crime and the criminal, both are two different issues. So that Jesus dying a criminal's death for sins is two things. It's not just dying for sins. You know, he died a criminal's death. That was you on the cross. It's what we don't understand. Like you need to follow Jesus into your own death just like that. So that's what people don't understand, and it ruins Christianity, so that people can carry on with their belief and make the Bible say whatever they want to. Like that old man I was telling you about says that, yeah, when it comes to once saved, always saved, here's a few scriptures that would make it look like you can walk away. And he showed a couple, which the whole Bible is screaming it from top to bottom, and he says, but I can give you hundreds that say you can never walk away. And I was like, oh, okay, I got where you're coming from, I'm trying to play both sides of the team. You know, he's not really, but you get what I'm saying? Not being definite about either side, so he doesn't offend anybody. But when you lean more towards the you can never walk away stuff, and then you'll be very popular, because people love to hear that. They want comfort. I'm like, you should want comfort by the comforter, and he will confirm what is true in your own life. Yeah. Not by what you've been hearing. What you've been hearing might not be true. You know, thank God for all the good they're doing. <laughs> well, my brother told me, my brother, when I was there. You brother who? That my brother that I'm told me he's my brother mm -hmm. in home. And uh, when I was there last time, I was very depressed and I don't understand what the problems were exactly, but um, uh, because of menopausal symptoms, I had cut my hair very, very short. And uh, I didn't have dentures and so I looked terrible to them, you know. And, uh, other than that, I, I had quit my medication for about two years, and I didn't know that the symptoms were creeping up on me again, which I, I didn't realize. It, it's just very subtle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm staying with my dad, and he's, he's very uh, friendly, abusive in a way, very politely so, but mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway. And, Little by little, I became so depressed, I couldn't take it anymore. And so I called my brother, and I said, I think I want to go back home. 
And he, I said, I need to be alone. I can't stand being with Papa and his wife. And I can't stand being with my mom because he said I betrayed, I betrayed her by being with my dad. And I, I just need to be by myself and get rest again somehow, get away from all that. And he said, well, it, it, it just so happened that one of my apartments in my drug treatment program building has come empty today. So I'll come and pick you up and you can sit there in that nice apartment all by yourself and get rest. <laughs> and so I was there and, and yeah, I got rest, but I was still really depressed. And I really didn't understand why I was depressed. It was just so um, nebulous or something. Probably and your childhood memories coming back. Maybe well, well, that didn't help. But anyway, well, you have to be alone sometimes. My, my brother looked at me one day and said, you, you have another comforter. In other words, you know, all the things I've used in the past to comfort me uh, have turned out to be not sufficient. And he was trying to tell me, let the Holy Spirit be your comforter. And that's what I understood him to say. But I don't know the first thing about letting the Holy Spirit be my comforter. <laughs> you know? And the only thing I knew to do was make a drawing of Jesus carrying me uh, up the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> but. Well, that would have been fine. I, I just don't understand when I go over there. It's like a trial, it's like an emotional minefield. And I just don't think there was a problem with you. Do you have that? Did I hear you say that if you go back to certain family, people, uh, or was it somebody else? What's that? Maybe it was Robbie. You don't need your book. Say that again? No, I mean, okay, maybe it was Robert instead of you. But somebody said to me, they have the same problem when they go back to their family. Everything just comes at you. And, uh, oh, they want to talk about it in the past, and, and you're the past to them. It's, it's just an emotional roller coaster. And my brother was trying to say, that the Holy Spirit, you know, that the Holy Spirit be your comforter. But I don't know how to do it. You know. I don't really know how to. Well, you're learning now. I, I, the only thing I know to do is just tell me whatever comes up in my mind and hope for the best. <laughs> well, you, you're working on that big thing, which yeah, a lot of people... I, I've gotten to my early adulthood so far. Good. Yeah. And you will handle all of those things as if you were on the receiving end. You get what I'm saying? No, I don't. Yeah, just like, like David and Nathan. You know, David was willing to kill the guy who was still guilty. Yeah. Because he literally saw it from the other side. Yeah. And he said, no, you are the man. You, you know what I'm saying? Man. Yeah, I know. So now you can imagine Nathan's here saying, you are the woman. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and in not a good way, because you're guilty. And if the things was flipped, you know, the Lord has, able, has allowed me to remember what it feels like for um, the other people, the other side of the, the other side of the stick. Yeah, I, I felt several different versions of the other side of the stick. Horrible, but all things work together for his good. Because if you want to put me on, you know, more leadership, I'm going to have to be understanding that some things do not feel good, and I'm going to have to know 